Hello friends. This is Muse Fanfictions. How are you all? So in this video, we will see what if Naruto had the power of Aru Ilubitar creator of all. Here is short summary. What if Naruto died in the valley of the end, and his soul was taken to Arda where he was turned into a Balrog of Morgoth. He dies at the hands of Gandalf the Grey, only to find that he is not ready to descend into oblivion. Read as Naruto returns to the elemental nations with the powers of shadow and flames. But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time. Let's begin the story. Naruto dies after receiving a lightning jutsu punch to the heart by his sensei, Kakashi after defeating Sasuke before the Uchiha could join Orochimaru. The last bit of the Kyuubi's soul joins with its other half within the Shinigami while Naruto's spirit is sent to another realm, becoming an Maya servant of the Valar. However, the first Dark Lord, Morgoth, takes him and turns him into a demon of power, or a Balrog. Except, because of the lingering power of the Nine-Tailed Fox still residing within Naruto, the former Melkor used eight of the Nine Tails of Power to fashion wings of shadow and the last one a tail engulfed in fire that matched the Balrog's flaming mane. The newly formed demon learned to use his large powerful form to rot terror to his master's foes, even creating swords, axes, and whips of flame to rain down on their enemies. Including the treacherous spider, Ungoliant, when she double-crossed Morgoth in order to devour the three Silmarils until the dark wailed an ear-piercing scream that, a, n, quote form the Silmarillion, the mountains shook, and the earth trembled, and the rocks were riven asunder. Deep in forgotten places that cry was heard. Far beneath the ruined halls of Angband, in the vaults to which the Valar in the haste of their assault had not descended, Valrogs lurked still, awaiting ever the return of their lord and now swiftly they arose and passing over Hithlam they came to Lameth as a tempest of fire. With their whips of fire, they freed the Dark Lord and drove away the giant spider. Naruto continued to serve Morgoth and the Balrog Captain Gothmog in the latter years as he participated in the Battle of the Sudden Flame, and the Siege of Gondolin. However, Captain Gothmog fell in the skirmish of Gondolin and after the War of Wrath Morgoth was finally defeated and many of his Balrog brethren were slain. The former Jinchuriki fled and buried himself deep in the roots of the Misty Mountains for thousands of years until he was awoken from his slumber during the Third Age by the dwarves of Khazad Dum and became known as Durin's Bane after slaying the king, Durin VI. After a year of terrorizing the dwarves and slaying their kin and kings, the dwarves abandoned their underground mine and kingdom that it was renamed the Mines of Moria. The horned Balrog lived there for 500 years and denied allying himself with the former second general of Morgoth who now called himself the Dark Lord Sauron. He would be a servant of evil no more for as he slept during his encased slumber, he dreamt of his past life and the many atrocities wicked men conspired to use him as a weapon of Konoha. Now a fellowship of a wizard, elf, dwarf, men, and hobbits trespass his domain, carrying a ring of power that called to him. However, the wizard Gandalf sealed the door preventing him from following until he cast a counter spell and bashed the door with his demon muscles. The Astari member yet again blocked his path upon the bridge of Khazad Dum. You cannot pass. The wizard cried defiantly as the Balrog ignited himself in his fiery glory to begin his clash with his power equal. I'm the servant of the secret fire, wielder of the flame of Anor. The dark fire will not avail you. Flame of Udin. Summoning his blade of fire. The Balrog raises his sword down with great force against the wizard's light domed shield. The magic shield shatters as the holy power destroys the Balrog's sword and causes him to stumble back a little. Outraged, he roars defiantly as the Balrog's opponent stands firm with his staff and sword in hand. Go back to the shadow. Gandalf commands the horned monstrosity. The Balrog leers in frustration as he takes one step forward and then calling upon his infamous flaming whip in hand spinning it fluidly in the air before creating a fierce orange, crack. But the wizard does not yield as he raises both his staff and sword high and with a mighty bellow that thunders within the cavernous realm. You, shall not, pass. Driving his staff to the narrow bridge a great flash of light engulfs them until it quickly vanishes as it had appeared. The ancient demon snorted at seeing that it did nothing. With a roar of confidence, the Balrog charged with his whip raised to strike a major blow to the weakening Astari. Unfortunately, 
The bridge collapsed under his feet as the Balrog tried to fly his way up to his opponent, but a powerful force continued to push the flaming demon down into the abyss that his wings couldn't elevate him. Still, with his whip in his right hand he twirled the flail onto the retreating wizard's right leg, forcefully causing Gandalf to drop both his weapons into the depths below as he struggled to hold onto the crumbled edge of the bridge. His strength nearly gone, Gandalf lets go and dives down to his falling foe as he grabs his trusted sword, glamdring the foe hammer. Landing on his chest, as the demon thrashed his body around trying to destroy the falling spell while feeling the effects of gravity as he reminisced being pushed off a cliff by a perverted toad in another lifetime, Gandalf began cutting into the Balrog's thick hide. The Balrog felt searing pain as the gondolin blade tip pierced into his scorching flesh. In a cry of defiance, the demon pushed the Astari off him and then backhanded the wizard to the side as they continued to fall into the abyss. His right wing hits a protrusion on the side of the walls as the Balrog tries to grab the tumbling wizard until he finally caught him in his left clawed hand. Ready to bite the trapped Greybeard's head off. Another wall protrusion meets his left wing and now he is unable to use it and goes into a great deal of pain that allows Gandalf to escape and grab hold of one of the Balrog's ram-like horns. Spinning out of pain and confusion the Balrog now finds that the wizard now has swung onto the top of his head and is now trying to pierce his skull as they near to a large cavern with the bottom being filled with dark waters. After falling into an underground lake below the disabled Balrog had its fire quenched and began to fight the Grey Wizard using the shadows as his ally until he fled down dark passages, climbing up the endless stair till he reached the mountaintop Zorak Ziggel with Gandalf trailing behind him. Once his enemy was upon the ruins of the peak on the eighth day of their skirmish, the Balrog set himself ablaze ready to battle to the end with his equal adversary. Their clash lasted for hours until in a faltering moment the Grey Wizard raised his sword as a lightning bolt struck the blade, empowering it for Gandalf to vanquish the flaring demon. When the former ninja saw the lightning-covered blade, his eyes were alit as he thought back to his first death. Flashback. Valley of the End it was a close call, but his two chest wounds from Sasuke's Chidori were almost closed and the last, loyal, Uchiha was now unconscious. Naruto couldn't wait to show Sakura how he had stopped their teammate from becoming the Snake Sage's next vessel. But first he needed to catch his breath and allow Kayubi to heal his wounds. After sitting along the side of their recent battle, Naruto felt someone coming close to their location. Only for Kakashi Hataki and his dog summons on his shoulder jumping down near Naruto and the unconscious Sasuke. Kakashi Sensei. Boy am I glad to see you. I did my duty and prevented Sasuke from joining Orochimaru. It's going to be great to see Sakura-chan, Granny Tsunade, and the rest of them to show our successful mission, Datbeo. Naruto smirked as the dog summon Pakun excused himself to return to his summon world. However, Kakashi had a strange look in his visible eye as he slowly walked towards Naruto. His right hand began to pulse with chakra the hand became encased with lightning chakra. Naruto grew nervous and drew back as his sensei strode closer and closer to him. Kakashi sensei? W what are you doing? No, I thought you weren't like those villagers that hate me because I hold the Kayubi. Please, I, that's all Naruto could say before Team 7's leader stood right in front of him and his Reikiri, lightning cutter, hand had pierced the young Jinchuriki's heart. HMPH, like I could care for a demon brat that was responsible for killing my sensei. Enjoy your last moments of life Kayubi. Minato sensei, I have avenged you. Kakashi proclaimed as he let Naruto's body sink beneath the water as he washed his hand clean of blood and then proceeded to get his favorite student and then body flickered in a swirl of leaves. Flashback end. Back to the snowy peak battle coming back to the present, the demon of shadow and flame bellowed as he quickly swiped with his claws to send the wizard over the edge of the peak and finally be free of his painful past life. But Gandalf saw the attack coming and ducked beneath the demon's swipe and thrusted his lightning-enhanced blade into the Balrog's heart. With a cry of anguish the fallen Maya arched his body back and then fell forward over the edge of Zarak Ziggle taking the weary Astari with him. Gandalf the Grey had thrown down his enemy and smote his ruin upon the mountainside. The wind and snow continued to blow as the wizard lay on a snow-covered cliff between the tower ruins of his battle and the tower base below where the Balrog lay as the cold temperatures put out the fires surrounding his body. As the last the of the fiery spark in the former ninja's eyes began to fade, he saw an image of a hunter nin with long black hair and a slender frame. 
The visage cried tears of snowflakes as he wept for the person whom the Balrog once was. You've lived a harsh life not once, but twice. Even after everything you've turned into, you are still one of my precious persons, Naruto. I hope we may see each other again, my friend. That was the last thing he heard before the demon of shadow and flame let darkness take him and the last known Balrog of Middle-earth died. Scene change, my child. I say unto thee arise. The demon of power awoke from the dreamless sleep as he looked around to see that he was standing upon white shores, smiley face, and clear silver-blue waters that stretched as far as the eye could see with the sky illuminated with stars, moons, and suns, that it seemed like he was gazing at the genesis of the cosmos. Looking down he saw that his demonic hoof-like feet were now perfect-looking man feet. Raising his hands, he looks at them to find them being perfectly white tanned hands with small claw-like nails on each finger. Gaping in awe and confusion he nears the clear waters to gaze at his own reflection. What he saw looking back at him was a young man's face having short spiky golden hair with red ends making it look like it was a flame. He still had his ram-like horns that pointed down just under his chin. His eyes were clear blue as the afternoon sky, and he still has his old whisker birthmarks running along his cheeks but more bolden. Standing up straight he peered to see that he was dressed in robes of white that covered his collarbone, wrists, and down to his ankles. He even had his salamander-like tail and bat-like wings poking out from the back of his snowy draped apparel. So many questions filled his thoughts, wondering where he was and why he was brought here. A few minutes later a great light shone above him and the voice he thought he would never hear again spoke to him. It has been more than a few millennia since we last saw one another my child. The voice spoke in a calm gentle speech that pierced Naruto's very soul as he bowed his head in reverence. Eru, I thought I had lost favor with thee when I fell and turned into one of Melkor's demons. I, I thought I was just a stranger to thee and thine children that sang great hymns of creation because I came from another realm. I sobbed, I felt I was unworthy to be like my fellow Valar and Maiar, and that thou wouldst hate me if you knew what I was. Naruto crumbled to his knees and began to weep in sorrow, his hands covering his face in shame as he released the many deep scars that plagued his soul for so long. After letting him release his pent-up distress, Eru let his comforting light fall upon Naruto and wrap around him like a father hugging his prodigal son. Arise, be of good cheer. I didst know what thou were and where ye came from. And know that I didst and shall love thee because thou art my child. For ye are special, both in Arda and the elemental nations. Naruto calmed down to look up and see that he was not alone with the father of all gods and goddesses. Four individuals came into his view as he looked to see two men and two women. The first man was the Maya that ended Naruto's reign in Moria, but now Gandalf had hair as white as snow. The second man was the fourth Hokage with one of the women standing right beside him. She had long red hair and violet eyes that took Naruto's breath away, and she wore a long green blouse over her white dress. The other woman had long orange hair that matched her nine tails that flowed behind her and pointed elf ears sticking out from the sides of her head, and her eyes were dark red, are carmen and her pupils were slits. Naruto-kun. The red head cried as she jumped onto him and gave him a bone-breaking hug. I'm so sorry, Databane. I warned Minato what could and did happen. I should have let Kayubi be resealed in me. The woman cried as she held firmly yet gently the stunned young man. Who are you lady? What do you mean having Kayubi resealed? And Databane. The former Jinchuriki exclaimed as he forced the red head off him. Kashina, he needs to be told who we are if he is to understand our intent. The blonde Hokage said as he put his hand on her shoulder to calm her down. I know who you are fourth Hokage. You are the man who condemned me to a life of misery and pain. One that I had no say in the matter. Why would you choose a clan less orphan like me to hold such a burden that the only solution that your village could think of was to kill me or turn me into a weapon for Konoha? Did you think that after going through so much I would love the village as you did? Now look at me. I became the demon they always saw me to be and even a monster in the world of Arda. Naruto growled in frustration ready to punch his once great idol in the face. Calm yourself Naruto, should not the father give hope to his only son when he is at the end of his life? A good father and mother would sacrifice all that they had to make certain their child could live on and carry their hope into the skies beyond. Gandalf said as he placed himself between the hybrid Balrog and the two adults. 
Naruto's mind spun as he came to the realization who the two really were in relation to him. Air, you truly, my M mother and F father. The two nodded their heads as they introduced his heritage. You are Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze, son of Minato Namikaze of the Namikaze clan in the Yellow Flash, and Kashina Uzumaki Namikaze, second holder of the Nine-Tailed Fox and Princess of the Uzumaki clan in the Red Death. We loved you even as we took our last breaths to save you from the Kyubi's rage and the strange man that tried to kill you in the village by controlling the Nine Tails the night you were born on October 10. Sorrow and hesitance covered his face as he turned to look away at his parents and fell again to his knees looking at the sea of glass. After thousands of years he finally learns who his family really is instead of the hateful words and lies Konoha fed him till his death. He didn't know what to think but to regret he had ever been born so Minato and Kashina could have lived and make the will of fire bright and true again. I wish none of this would have happened. I wish things were different for them and me. Gandalf calmly walked to Naruto's side and sat down watching the waves of silver flow back and forth from the shores before turning to look at the gloomy Maya. A young hobbit said those same words to me as our fellowship traversed the dark caverns of Moria. Do you know what I told him? I said, so to all who live to see such times but that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. There are other forces at work in this world and your world besides that of evil. Minato was meant to seal the fox in which case you were meant to have it. And isn't that an encouraging thought? After hearing that the young man smiled before the strange elf with nine tails sat on Naruto's other side. I don't like being called, it, but yes it seemed I was meant to be your burden during our time together. I am so sorry you had to deal with my crap and the crap of those idiotic villagers who thought you were me. I know that I can't say much for myself, but I'd clarify that I was forced and controlled to attack twice. Both because an egotistic Uchiha who think because having powerful eyes that can control tailed beasts, they should use our power to destroy anything that stands in their way. We Biju never wanted to become trapped in objects or human vessels. We were tasked to guard and protect the world from evil forces that would awaken in the hearts of men or in the shadows of the past. The strange woman, revealing herself to be the Kayubi, then told her true name to Naruto because after really seeing the life he lived, he had earned Kurama's respect and guilt as she vowed to be his devoted companion and first mate which caused Naruto to blush as Kurama teasingly stroked his horns. Wait, you make it sound like we are going somewhere. Verily, my child, Aloran shall return to Arda to complete his task in putting an end to Myron's schemes. Thou and Kurama shall return to the elemental nations to restore the kingdom of the tides and to destroy the schemes of the deceiver and abolish the evils of your world. Thou shalt have the power of your fallen Maiar state and change whenever thou desire. Aloran has blessed thee with the knowledge and power he wields for ye are worthy to wield both the fires of Anor and Udin. Thou shalt regain the waters of your mother and the winds of thy father to strengthen thee and protect thine past and future companions. As the mighty Eru proclaimed these things, Naruto felt he had his chakra network again as well as Gandalf's knowledge of magic and the spell making of fireworks. Boy he couldn't wait to try out that skill for entertainment of both good and prankster worthy tricks. But then, he felt another chakra power flow within him as he looked into the distance to see his old friend and former enemy Haku giving his feminine smile. Kashina and Minato both gave Naruto and his vixen companion a hug and a few words of advice, for Kashina she commanded Naruto to give her lots of grandbabies to spoil in the afterlife, and for Kurama an apology for her prejudice containing in a haunted warning to treat her Sochi, son, well or the red death would fall upon the ancient fox. Before thou and thy companion leave, wouldst thou sing for me and thine family? The great Eru implored as a flute appeared into Naruto's hand and a large concourse of angelic Ainur appeared, some bearing musical instruments of every kind, while the rest had their voices ready as instruments. In dreams, Mormon Tabernacle Choir Watch, V equals Hingvelum 3Q. After he finished singing Naruto wept in joy for he finally felt whole and complete that he hadn't felt for so long. His parents waved farewell as Gandalf smiled when a light engulfed him, and he was gone. The nine-tailed Biju held onto her winged companion as another light engulfed the two and they were gone. Naruto opened his eyes to see that he was lying in the riverbed near the two stone statues of Hashirama and Madara, a n, kind of like the Gondor King statues in the Fellowship of the Ring movie, where he fought Sasuke and Kakashi backstabbed him, 
Something squirmed on top of him as he looked to see Karama hugging him close with her body mashed with his scarred torso and her nine tails coiled around both of their legs. Oh, and they were naked. Well, well, I wouldn't mind being resurrected if I were to always be like this with you under me, Naruto-kun. The hourglass figure Kitsune said as she moved her hands up and down Naruto's folded bat-like wings until she reached to the back of his neck and slid up to meet his face while keeping her cleavage pressed against his muscled chest. Before she could move her lips to meet his, she stopped and squirmed as Naruto's tail got free from the vixen's tails and began to tickle her sides and her exposed back. Not wanting to be outdone Karama tried to steal his first kiss, only to arch back and moan in pleasure as Naruto's tail whipped her butt. With that, Naruto escaped the Kitsune's grasp and stood up a good six feet tall and looking like he is in his early adult years, age 19 to 21, using his winged appendages to cover his nakedness, a n like the gargoyles from the Disney Gargoyles show. I'm afraid that we'll have to wait until we can get far away from Fire Country. I think we should head to Wave Country and begin searching for this, Kingdom of Tides Aru spoke of. Do you know what that might mean, Kurama-chan? Kurama blushed at being called that by her future mate, before standing up herself with her beautiful fluffy tails covering her front while looking like no water had touched them. I actually do know Naruto-kun. But first I need to fill you in on certain details about your heritage and the laws of being the last of two clans. Plus, we need to get used to fighting with Chakra again, I haven't felt whole since after our unexpected demise, so I need get back into shape like you. However, can we head over in that direction? I sense some of my Chakra still lingers over there and that concerns me. Nodding in agreement with Karama's assessment, the two demonic entities walked out from the riverbank and into the woods. Scene change. One week later, near the Great Naruto Bridge, a 12-year-old Inari is fishing while thinking of the heroic ninja that he was proud to call his surrogate older brother. Almost four years have passed since the sad news of Naruto's untimely death and his body was never recovered. The grandson of a great builder wondered by some miracle if he would ever get to see his big bro. His thoughts were interrupted as he heard a horse-pulled wagon coming over the bridge to the land of waves. Inari squinted to get a good look at the group in the wagon. What he saw made him widen his eyes in shock as he quickly rubbed his eyes to see if he was imagining things only to smile brightly as he drops his fishing rod and runs to meet the wagon at the end of the bridge. The driver of the wagon had a dark black robe with a hood pulled over his head and his female companion wearing an exquisite red kimono that rested past her shoulders to show a little of her slim figure. Just as they were about to fully cross the bridge and enter wave country, Teenager Inari ran right in front of the carriage causing the driver to pull his reins to his humble grey horse with white mane and tail as the apprentice builder climbed up one the rectangular columns that ended on each side of the bridge. When Inari reached the top base of the pillar, he folded his arms giving a scolding face to the driver as if he were his commanding officer. You're late. The driver's face was stern as he turned his blue eyes to meet the black spiky hair's own. And Uzumaki is never late, Inari-san nor is he early. He arrives, precisely, when he means to. The two continued to stare at one another until the driver's stern facade slowly broke as a smile crept up his face and Inari also smiling as the two shared a heartfelt laugh at the joke that they just played. Inari jumped into Naruto's lap and hugged him as his hood fell from his head revealing his neck-length golden locks with fire-red tips, his horns and wings were hidden under a powerful genjutsu until he chooses to reveal them. It's wonderful to see you again Naruto Nissan. I hoped that they were wrong when they said you were gone. Inari said as he quickly wiped away his happy tears. But here you are alive again, and with a pretty lady with you. Is she your girlfriend or something? Don't worry Inari Ni, when we get to your place, I will tell you everything. I've missed you, you little crybaby. Naruto chuckled as Inari pouted and lightly punches his stomach at that small reminder. Hey, flame head. Stop with the sappy reunion and get a move on. I'm not waiting another minute to get fixed up, so I can beat the crap out of that duck butt Uchiha. An irritated voice called out from the back of the wagon when a malnourished tomboy woman with long dirty red hair that reached her lower back and fierce brown eyes peered from over some freshly made fireworks that would reveal itself for the first time in the elemental nations when tomorrow's evening festivities commenced. She was one of the former Sound Four that miraculously survived her dual battle between the lazy shadow strategist and that blowhard fangirl, 
It turns out Tuyuya Uzumaki didn't really die that day as the excessive chakra that left Naruto's dying body scattered to the winds and some of it surrounding the unconscious Kunoichi and cocooned her in a comatose state while filtering and destroying the tainted chakra and soul piece of Orochimaru and keeping her alive. Naruto and Kurama found her a day after being resurrected and Naruto using his favorite shadow clone Jutsu to find a nearby bandit camp to raid where they found a wagon filled with trinkets and clothes, and a horse grazing in a fenced pen. After receiving their new found resources and taking them to their new owners the clones killed and burned the bandits in their camp as the maker and his companion dressed themselves while Naruto slowly dispersed his clones after Kurama explained to him the advantages of the jutsu that he was never told. Pulling her cocoon out from between two fallen tree trunks, the nine-tailed fox absorbed her missing chakra and revived the kunoichi from her three-year coma. Tuyuya was not pleased for her disabled state and swore like a sailor until the two companions calmed her down to give her a new life to live now that the pedophile's curse mark was destroyed we was free to join their group in training to relearn and strengthen their abilities and get back at Orochimaru, Sasuke, and the Konoha village. Now, Tuyuya was getting impatient as the two lovebirds made a few stops to sell their goods and get the strange powders and equipment that Naruto needed to make, fireworks, as he called it, as well as ninja fighting gear to help them in their training. The tomboy red head was anxious for Naruto to do as he promises and heal her, so she can work and use her legs again without the need for flame head or vile vixen to carry her in a way that left her in a blushing shamble. She would not admit it, but Tuyuya thought flame head looked handsome, even with his demonic horns, wings and tail. Naruto interrupted her trail of thinking as they neared the bridge builder, Tazuna's home. Inari's mother, Tsunami saw her apprentice son running up to the house after jumping off that stranger's wagon. Ka-san, is Gigi home yet? I have a surprise for both of you that it can't wait. Inari. What's got you so? She stopped when she saw Naruto's face. I it, it can't be. Naruto, is that really you? Indeed Tsunami-chan. It's me. But first, would it be alright if me and my companions come inside? Tsunami wasted no time as she ushered them in with Naruto carrying Tuyuya in a bridal hold that caused her to slightly blush while respecting the former leaf shinobi for not touching her inappropriately. Two hours later, well, I gotta say boyo, you sure had quite an afterlife hick, Tazuna. The old bridge builder finally came home and listened with the rest of his family the tales Naruto spun of Arda, and then drinking three jugs of sake before voicing his response. The bridge builder family and Naruto's fellowship had just finished partaking in their evening meal as Naruto told of his story and even removed the genjutsu hiding his horns, wings, and tail. Inari was dazzled at Naruto's new features, and Tuyuya was also secretly glancing at his new look as she quietly lay beside the dinner table. Tsunami left with a plate of food and a bag of medicine into another room where a mysterious patient was being care given while she too listened to the Uzumaki's story. Hey Flamehead. Sorry for the crap I put you through earlier. I think your new looks and attitude are a better improvement compared to the loudmouth brat with piss for hair and brains and wearing a neon orange target that begged me to punch him in the face. Naruto snorted at the crude remark. Does that mean you don't want me to heal you to Yuya Chan? Shush shut up. I'm not waiting another minute being a crippled Kunoichi. To Yuya stuttered turning her head to the side while forcing down a blush that crept up her cheeks after she saw the mischievous looks from the hot demon and the fox hag. A voice muttered from the other room where Tsunami went. Got room for one more? If she gets a miracle cure, I want in two. Tsunami then came out with a pale shinobi with long red hair with two bangs sticking up, her arm draped over Tsunami's shoulder as Inari's mother dragged her to Tuyuya's and Naruto's side. Naruto raised an eyebrow at seeing the secretive guest when his eyes glanced over her and saw the forehead protector engraved with the symbol of Kiri, the hidden mist village. Seeing that reminded him of the former demon of the mist which he later planned to pay his respects at the legendary swordsman's gravesite. Tsunami introduced to the Uzumaki company Amayuri Ringo, one of the seven swordsmen of the mist. She was found passed out near Wave Country before news of the Kiri civil war had finally ended. Tazuna and his family volunteered to take care of her in memory of her fellow swordsman who killed the midget tyrant, Gato. Naruto accepted as any friend of Zabuza's was a friend of his. Allowing Tsunami to place Amayuri next to him, the former Jinchuriki laid his hands over the former sound nins and swordswoman's heads as a fire of ethereal white covered the palms of his hands. The flames of Anor were not only the bane of wicked dwellers of shadow, 
but also a warm comforting light to those with good in their souls that could also heal the mind, body, and spirit. Muttering in an unknown language that made it incoherent for all those present except for the Kayubi, Naruto slowly opened his eyes as the mystic fire encompassed the two Kunoichi without scorching their apparel or the wooden floor they sat on for a couple of minutes before the ethereal wisps of light diminished. After several minutes, the two tomboy ninjas opened their eyes and groggily sat up and took a couple of glances over their body to see if anything changed. The shark-toothed red head saw that her skin was no longer a ghostly pale and that she could breathe normally. Tuyuya gazed at her previous twig legs no looked like they were the legs of a strong sexy supermodel. Taking a leap of faith, they both rose to stand up on their feet and take their first steps of renewed health and strength. Tears poured from the smart mouth's caramel eyes at being able to fully walk with her kick butt limbs, while ebony-eyed Ringo gave a gleeful toothy smirk like it was her birthday and she caught sight of a big tasty morsel. Naruto wasn't prepared when he has knocked down to the wooden floor with both Kunoichi hugging him tight like he was their big horned teddy bear. The Elden vixen watching the scene, silently trembling as feelings of jealousy crept up her spine at seeing them in that peculiar position. But soon those thoughts of envy passed as she smirked wickedly, remembering that she had a better hold and view of her future mate's body when they were brought back to this chakra-powered world. Scene change Naruto lazily walked through the woods and hills of Wave Country on this sunny afternoon. He hoped he would find that the resting place of the Demon of the Mist and Ice Angel were in one piece. His thoughts wandered, thinking of the sleeping arrangement he had with the three rose top ladies. After the two healed Kunoichi dog piled him and continued to stay that way for a couple of minutes, Kurama got up and argued with them on who would sleep with him that night. The redhead sword wielder didn't want to let go of her newly claimed alpha and teased her two competitors of the things that would put a shock to Naruto's system. Tuyuya held Naruto's arm close to her chest as she claimed that both he and her are both Uzumaki, so they should stick together. The elven Kayubi argued that she should have Naruto to herself because she's his mate and she wants to seal the deal, to be by his side always. Plus, she pointed out that she already got to see his wicked figure which made both Tuyuya and Amiuri jealous that they had a three-way tug of war with the pointed-eared vixen holding Naruto's head close to her ample chest with her cleavage partially showing under her kimono while the two kunoichi pulled his arms into their chests. Tsunami ended the argument with a frying pan to the heads and telling them that Naruto would sleep in the guest room while the three females would share Amiuri's sleeping quarters. After a good rest, Naruto rose early to not disturb his hosts and companions to go see how things have changed in Wave Country. Not knowing that his absence would cause Kurama, Tuyuya, and Amayuri to go into a frenzy just to find him. Coming out of his thoughts, the reborn Uzumaki came to a grove of trees where two graves stood with one being marked with the massive Kabikirabocho blade. Looking around him one last time to sense that he was alone, Naruto removed his henge disguise to show his horns, wings, and tail. Hey Zabuza, it's been a very long time since I last saw or spoke to you. As you can see, I got myself turned into a literal demon, specifically a demon of shadow and flames. I bet you're jealous that I took your moniker one step further. It's a long story, but the shortened version is I died by Kakashi's Reikiri, got reborn in another world, turned into a fiery demon and killed many beings with my flaming weapons and power, fell asleep under a mountain got woken up and turned an underground city, mine into my home, fought another powerful being and lost, and now I'm back here with a sexy vixen as my fiancé and two more red heads wanting to join my growing family, clan. Naruto paused to chuckle at that last bit of info before staring back at the sword marker. You'll be happy to know that I saw Haku there and he became an actual angel that helped pull me out of my abyss. I bet you've been spending your time in the afterlife tormenting Gato and any other scumbags that deserve torment. If it's alright with you, I'd like to take your blade and use it to get back at Kakashi for killing us both and continue your legacy as one of the legendary swordsmen of the mists. After making his request, a misty fog rose up out of nowhere and surrounded Naruto. Looking around he couldn't find anyone there until he looked back at the graves and saw murky image of Zabuza lazily sitting on the embedded decapitating blade. Even though the spirit's face was covered with bandages, Naruto could make out the shark-toothed grin underneath before the ghost closed his eyes and dipped his head down as a show of respect and acceptance. In a small gust of wind, the spirit vanished, and the fog faded away only leaving Naruto alone in the grove. Wiping the happy tears that fell from his eyes, 
The former unpredictable ninja of Konoha walked up to the blade and touched the hilt. A swirl of mist, fire and wind surrounded the blade as it turned into a hand and a half-sword infused with Naruto's powers like the weapon the previous Grey Wizard from Arda used in their final battle on the tower. It was colored black as night with red runes written along its bevel and handle. The sword also had embedded in its hilt an oval-shaped crimson gem that gave off an amber-like glow within. Naruto took another glance at the former Kabikirabocho before placing it onto his belted hip and walked back to return to Tazuna's house. Scene change watching the sunset, Naruto was sitting on the porch with Tazuna and the rest of them as he and old bridge builder were smoking their pipes. Inari's grandpa was showing off his smoking skills by creating rings of smoke that glided in the still air. Inari was impressed by his grandpa's talent while Tsunami reprimanded her son by telling him that he can't smoke until he's older, which made the young man frown at having to wait that long. Naruto smirked as he pulled his pipe from his mouth and formed a ship with his smoke and had it sail through the rings before they disappeared. Everyone was in awe at Naruto's magic that when they turned to look at him, they caught a glimpse of twinkling lights in his blue eyes. Putting his pipe away, Naruto stretches his arms before wrapping them around Amiuri sitting on his right and Tiyuya on his left. Kurama walked on over and sat in his lap as the three ladies cuddled close to his body as they continued to watch the sunset, thinking on what tomorrow might bring. Deep beneath the hidden village of Aim in Rain Country, the Akatsuki were gathered together to discuss their plans on capturing the remaining Jinchuriki and the current news of the elemental nations. Pain, the Rinnegan wielding cloaked man began the meeting. Three years have passed since we all met together. Much has changed, and we have been growing in strength to bring about the future peace we desire. Zetsu, what do you have to report? The plant like creature, Zetsu, stepped forward as his white side face spoke up, followed by his darker half completing his sentence. The Ichibi container is now the cage of Suna, he may be surrounded by walls, but he is the weakest of the Jinchuriki. The female container of Nibi has been seen patrolling the borders of lightning and wind so it should be easy to corner that flaming cat. The Mizukage was killed in his own civil war and the three tails should now be reformed but we have no idea where it is hidden. The four and five tails are somewhere in rock country, but they have been cast out of Iwa to keep them from going berserk on them. We already have the six tails extracted and placed in the ghetto statue. However, Taki and Kumo have taken great lengths to hide the seven and eight tails. And what of the Kyubi? Has it reformed after our last report? To think that the thousand technique Kakashi would slay his own student in order to avenge his fallen sensei. Said Pain as the rest of the Akatsuki members murmured to themselves. One of the cloaked members, the infamous Uchiha slayer Itachi stood in silence next to his shark-themed partner Kisame having a blank look on his face. But inside, a torrent of feelings was spinning within the former Anbu of Konoha since he usually stopped and protected the young Uzumaki from mob attacks in memory of the boy's secret mother who was friends with Itachi's mother, Makoto. Another Akatsuki member, Madara, real name Obito Uchiha, continued using his Tobi persona while inside he was seething. His former teammate Kakashi had ruined his life not only once from killing his crush Rin, but also killing the Kyubi container and maybe destroying his one chance in completing his moon eye plan and becoming a god to all. He didn't even care that the brat was his surrogate mother's son. All love for Kashina and his former sensei died when he watched the love of his life die in front of him. He didn't even care when he threatened the newly born child's life and extracted the Kyubi from Kashina's weakened body. But Minato stopped Obito from destroying Konoha and having his vengeance. Now Tobi could only sulk and plan accordingly. The Kyubi has not been reformed. We believe that the sealing method that the fourth Hokage used made it so that when the Nine Tails died with its container it would stay dead and never return. Zetsu replied. Pain narrowed his purple ringed eyes at hearing this. But Zetsu was not done. However, we have been getting rumors of a boy hidden with the monks of the Fire Temple. That this Sora was implanted with the Kyubi's chakra when he was a baby after the Kyubi's resealing 16 years ago. We also think that the remains of the Lightning Silver and Gold Brothers carry leftover chakra from the Nine Tails because of their previous encounter with it. Unfortunately, we need them alive in order to extract the chakra from them and we don't want Orochimaru getting involved in our business again. Ames Angel spoke up. We should leave the Lightning Brothers for later if retrieving the boy monk becomes impossible. If we do come to that, 
we can kill Orochimaru for his betrayal and one of us could learn the forbidden jutsu that the snake used in his failed attack on Konoha. Agreed. Is there anything else Zetsu? Pain inquired. Only that Danzo is still secretly building his root forces behind the current Hokage's back. We also have heard of the celebration in Wave Country that used devices like Didara's explosion jutsu called fireworks. It was incredible seeing the colorful booms that lit the night sky. The white zetsu complemented which irked yet intrigued the ponytailed blonde Didera. HMPH, it seems that I should go to Wave Country and find out about these fireworks. For my art to truly become the superior one to Sasori's puppets, hum, said Didera. The hunchbacked Akatsuki with the flaying metal tail merely scoffed at his partner's proclamation. No, you and Sasori are to capture the case cage. While Hidan and Kakazu go to corner the Nibi vessel, Itachi and Kisame will take the Jinchuriki of Iwa. Zetsu, you are to continue searching for the reformed Biju in Water Country. Pain instructed the members as one by one the members' body flickered leaving Pain, Conan, and Toby alone with the ghetto statue. Soon, all will know Pain, said the former Nagato Uzumaki before the shadows engulfed him. Scene change, three days later. Konoha was no longer the peaceful village proclaimed to hold the will of fire. Now civilians hold most of the power while the current Hokage, Tsunade Senju, was merely a figurehead. All the fifth Hokage could do was sign paperwork, argue with the council, and drown in her sake since her last ray of sunshine, Naruto Uzumaki, wasn't there to brighten her mood. It sickened her to know that Sasuke supposedly dealt the blow that killed the villagers' pariah. Tsunade wanted to do nothing more than seal the Uchiha elite and lock him up and throw away the key, however Team 7's Sensei Kakashi, along with the Konoha elders and civilian council, opted to congratulate Sasuke for achieving this and only gave him a slap on the wrist. After the rest of the retrieval team returned, along with their Suna allies, Tsunade ordered Anbu to find Naruto's body which Kakashi said had washed away after the battle. Tamari, Konkuro, and Gara left with a sour taste in their mouths at seeing most of Konoha revel at the news of the fallen Uzumaki. Suna now considered Konoha a neutral ally, while Wave, Snow, Spring, and the Moon Kingdom cut all ties to them because they considered the Kayubi Jinchuriki a hero and friend. Tsunade never got answers from Gara, the now appointed Kay's Cage, on why whenever he did business with her would stare with hidden rage in his eyes at the lazy one eyed Kakashi while keeping a neutral frown around the village elders Homura. Kaharu, and Danzo. For three years, Tsunade put up to try and keep Naruto's memory alive, but with the continual complaints of the civilians, the nagging ego of the Uchiha, and the prompts to attack other villages from Danzo and his lackeys, she could only find solace in working with her assistant Shizune in the hospital. Even her own teammate, the gallant perverted toad sage, Jiraiya, barely showed his face in Konoha, unless it was reports from his spy network or have short talks with Tsunade. No matter how much sake she drank, the Senju and Uzumaki blood boiled at working in this fallen cesspool of a village that her grandparents created. After finalizing the last of the bane of cages, she would finally be free from this place while taking Shizun and the rest of their things to never return to Konoha. Suddenly, the window to the Hokage office opened as Jiraiya himself popped in. Hey Haim, there has been Akatsuki movement. Although they went quiet for a few years, they are now moving again to capture the Jinchuriki. Said Jiraiya. It was at that moment, Danzo and the two elders walked through the door without receiving permission to enter. Tsunade, we have just received word that the case cage has been abducted and they require our assistance. We should use this opportunity to get back into Suna's graces to return their leader. Said Danzo in a manner that made him sound like he's in charge. Tsunade growled at the rudeness of the elders. That's Hokage-sama to you, Danzo. And who would you suggest I should send to retrieve Gara? We believe Kakashi and the reformed Team 7 should go, to show the power Sasuke has to defeat whoever did this and give Suna another reason to send us a generous charity to improve Konoha's livelihood, said the wrinkled old hag Kaharu. I decline under protest, because Gara and his siblings abhor Sasuke, Sakura, and Kakashi for failing at being Naruto's team, Tsunade pointed out to them. The Kayubi Jinchuriki was never meant to become a strong shinobi to upstage the Uchiha and his team. Plus, it's for the good of the village to demonstrate that we are not weak without our failed weapon," said Danzo before he was grabbed by his collar and thrown into the wall by the slug sage. 
How dare you? Because of that spoiled brat, we have lost the legacy of our fourth Hokage and the Uzumaki bloodline is considered extinct. Said Tsunade. After not finding his body, Naruto's parentage was released to the public. Some of the village were rocked with shame, while most full-on denied the evidence of the Kayubi brat's lineage. Some Naruto supporters, like the Ichiraku family, abandoned ship and moved to the now-named Spring Country to escape Konoha prejudice. Regardless Tsunade, the council has already voted on it and the majority approve of Team 7's mission, said Homura in his old uptight stature. Tsunade was mad with rage that the council once again going behind her back. With her super senju strength, she threw the Hokage chair into the bookshelf, which shattered the chair while the bookshelf fell over. A hidden Anbu lay under the shelf unconscious at Tsunade's outburst. All right you idiots. That's it. You want to run this village, then you do it. I quit. A. Eh. And like an emperor's new groove when Kronk replaces the chef. Jiraiya and the elders were stunned at Tsunade's proclamation that they tried to coerce her to reconsider while she took things from the Hokage vault, even the scroll of sealing without them seeing and sealed them away into another scroll as she went to get her belongings from the Senju compound with her apprentice following behind her without any complaints. Tsunade, please. You are the last of the Senju. Without you, Konoha will be weaker in the eyes of the other hidden villages. Said Jiraiya while begging on his knees under his dream crush while she frowned at what he said. If you do this Tsunade, we will be forced to label you as a missing nin and will place you in the bingo book but perhaps we can allow you to join Team 7's retrieval team as a chaperone and medical ninja," said Danzo as his dark mind turned to remove Tsunade while she accompanied Kakashi and one of his root agents. Your relationship with Tsuna will have the mission go more smoothly as you go to rescue the K's cage. Tsunade narrowed her eyes because she knew the old war hawk was up to something. Thinking it over, she realized this would be the opportune moment after saving Gara to slip away with Shizun so they could escape and settle down in one of the countries that remembered and honored her godson's memory. Turning to face the elders, she nodded her head. Fine. I will accompany Kakashi and the rest of Team 7 to rescue the K's cage. But once this is over, I never want to see your Baka faces again. She said as she headed to the Senju compound. Jiraiya went to return to his spy network and learn more on the Akatsuki's objective. The elders simply stood there, ignoring the pictures of the former Hokage that seemed to be frowning at the state Konoha has become under Danzo's underhanded tactics. Scene change Tsunade and Shizun, along with Team 7, are now hauling themselves with Gara's sister Tamari, to reach Gara's abductors after healing and hearing the reports from Konkuro. The slug sage was fuming as the last loyal Uchiha tried to flirt with fan wielding Kunoichi to become one of his child bearers and restore the Uchiha clan. Tamari answered with her closed fan bonking Sasuke on the duck butt head. Sakura, still the Uchiha loving fangirl, was screeching with her banshee voice that Tamari should feel honored in restoring the Uchiha clan. Tsunade thanked her stars that she full on denied teaching the pink banshee her jutsu against Kakashi and Hanora's pestering. She only wished she had her lost crystal necklace that washed away along with Naruto's body. The replacement ninja, Sai, was a pale-faced painter that rarely showed emotion because of his secret training with Root but had quite a potty mouth that didn't know how to properly communicate with others, including his teammates whenever he said their nicknames, he gave to them. However, Sai secretly had a separate mission along with Kakashi in the termination of Tsunade when the mission would come to an end so no Konoha secrets could be leaked out. As they followed the Tsuna elder Chio, who volunteered to tag along and make up for her past mistakes, the trail to Gara was stopped by the cloaked figures of Itachi and Kisame who had already completed their Jinchuriki retrieval. Sasuke was the first to act by flaring a Chidori in hand to strike his older brother to finally avenge the Uchiha. Kisame decided to have fun with Kakashi and Tsunade's super strength. Sai and Sakura decided to be Sasuke's backup and cheerleading squad while Tamari, Shizun, and Chio watched from the sidelines to analyze these Akatsuki. It's quite fun that I am fighting the Kakashi of 1000 Jutsu and Slayer of Zabuza, the runt of the Seven Swordsmen of the Mist. But also, one of the three sages proclaimed by Hanzo, although you were better fighter than that white snake who was a part of our group until he turned traitor. I wonder who will go down first, the traitorous snake, the lecherous toad, or the slug sucker. Said Kisame in order to antagonize his opponents.
It worked for Tsunade as she went give the shark man a good right hook that could knock his head right off his shoulders. However, Kisame was quick to use the shredding blade Samahata to block the Senju Fist of Fury. While blocking her attack, Kisame didn't have time to defend himself as Kakashi went through a set of hand signs. Fire Style Fire Dragon Jutsu Kakashi breathed out a swirl of fire that turned into a serpentine dragon that charged at the two combatants. Tsunade jumped back before the attack hit Kisame as she looked at Kakashi who gave a lazy shrug before jumping to his pupil's location. Before Tsunade could jump after him, Kisame stood up raising Samahata, who ate the chakra from Kakashi's jutsu, to cut the slug sage to shreds. Tamari and Shizun stood between Kisame's prey as they fired wind and earth jutsu to push him back, but to no avail. The two kunoichi were pushed to either side with small to mid-level cuts covering their bodies. Seeing her friend and apprentice weary from the multiple bloody cuts caused her to freeze in terror as her forgotten phobia kicked in to paralyze her. Without Naruto to be there for her, her insecurities and phobia slowly rose to the surface during those three stressful years. Suddenly, Kisame was impaled from behind as the two Kiba blades sparked with electrifying precision. Hey fish face, it's been a while. My Kiba blades wanted have a misty sword reunion with Samahata and the others, but you won't be here when that happens. Said Amayuri as she used her chakra to boost her strength in lifting Kisame high into the hair before proclaiming, lightning style, lightning rod jutsu. And blue lighting lit the sky before crashing down on the shark shinobi. As the dust settles, the red-haired Ringo dropped the now-fried body of the supposed monster of the hidden mist to the ground. But it was not Kisami's body that was fried, but a poor Suna ninja pawn. Amayuri clicked her shark-like teeth in frustration at being duped for zapping a doppelganger. Before the swordswoman could walk away, she was stopped by Tsunade. Hold on. Are you Amayuri Ringo, one of the seven swordsmen of the mists, and the wielder of the Kiba blades? What are you doing here? I thought with your rumored disease you would have been bedridden or even kicking the bucket by now. The Senju blonde asked in suspicion. Amayuri shrugged it off and put her duo swords away, behind her back. Yeah. Well let's just say that I got a guardian devil that fixed me up and now I really want to get a piece of him. Not easy with a vixen and the other redhead vying for the guy. Her answer confused Tsunade. Not that he can handle all three of us at once, because he sure can, but he's got his mind focused on other things. Like right now, the Shadow Oni has his sights on destroying the Akatsuki. Which works for me because I got a bone to pick with old Tuna head. But what about you? Aren't you the Hokage of Konoha? Since when does a tree hugger leave her land to go save a leader from another village? Ringo asked with her shark teeth grinning in glee. I finally had enough of dealing with the civilian council and their hound leaders, so I quit. Now, I'm just here to help a friend of a person I considered to be my grandson. Although, now I want to turn a certain scarecrow into mulch. Want to help me to get back at the guy who skewered Zabuza? Tsunade smiled as gleefully to match the swordswoman's at hearing that last bit on her old teammate. The two kicked off the ground as they hurried to catch up to the rescue crew. Scene changed Chio and Team 7 reached to a large boulder with a ceiling tag on it where Kakashi used his Sharingan to see the K's cage being drained of the Ichibi in the dark cave. The head captain looked back to inform his and the sudden appearance of Team Guy on what the situation looked like. Sasuke only growled in frustration at failing to defeat Itachi's puppet and letting the focus of his vengeance slip away. Sakura was being her usual fangirl self while Sai stared blankly at the mission's current setting. Tsunade and Amayuri caught up to find the teams discussing on what to do. Kakashi's eyes looked lamely at Tsunade's arrival as well as seeing a foreign ninja right beside her. Excuse me, miss. This is a Konoha and Suna mission. Please be on your way. Shut up. Scarecrow. I am in charge until the K's cage is rescued. Roared Tsunade, still mad at Kakashi's little burn and ditch fight. This is Amayuri Ringo. One of the seven swordsmen of the mists, who was in the area when she helped me out in ending Kisami's puppet. She and her allies are here to help defeat the Akatsuki, so no complaints because we need all the help we can get. Now what's the situation? She commanded while Kakashi started to sweat at seeing another swordsman of the mists. He didn't want to get in the way of the lightning hound of Kiri. Her infinity for lightning made her immune to Kakashi's Rakiri. 
Add to the fact of her rumored skill in full usage of the silent killing technique that made her on par if not a stronger and deadlier fighter than the former demon of the mist, Zabuza. Yosh, my youthful lady Tsunade, replied the eccentric mighty guy. The case cage Gara is right behind this boulder barrier. Unfortunately, the unyouthful Akatsuki have placed a five-layered seal that prevents us from destroying the boulder and rescuing the case cage. We would have to find and destroy the four seals that are somewhere in this region before we can destroy the final seal. Yes, Sensei. With the power of youth, we will find and destroy the seals. Guy grinned with pride at his Lee's words before both did a dramatic pose in front of everyone. Everyone blankly stared at the pair before the Misty Swordswoman burst into laughter at seeing the two clowns' theatrix. I like your enthusiasm, you two. Fortunately, there's no need to go on this scavenger hunt. I know a guy that is very adept at creating and destroying seals. Right Shadow Oni? She proclaimed with Tsunade and the others looking at her in confusion. A deep breath was heard and felt near Kakashi's shoulder as the Junin whirled around to face the new guy. Tsunade, Chio, and the two Konoha teams stared in surprise at the appearance of the new addition in the bingo book, Shadow Oni. Wearing black samurai armor, the Shadow Oni looked fierce and intimidating especially with his black oni mask worn over his face. The strange thing though was that the horns on the mosque's head were curving down instead of upwards. The other distinguishing feature was his dark sword which looked like a strange straight katana with a longer guard hilt sheathed on his left hip. Very little was known written on the shadow oni, other than his appearance and the exploits of death performed on robbers, traffickers, and others. He was classified as a a rank threat with his impressive kenjutsu skills, his strange infinities for fire and shadow. Being capable of using shadows to mask his presence, made Shikamaru and his clan, the Nara clan, shiver at the man's capabilities. Though he hasn't been known to have fought any shinobi, which was why he was marked as an A rank threat, he was considered strong and dangerous with a flea on sight warning in the bingo book. Stepping forward, Tsunade went to greet their mysterious contributor. Shadow Oni, I am Tsunade Senju soon to be former leaf shinobi and fifth hokage of konoha are you truly capable of destroying the five layered seal getting a simple nod from the cloaked warrior then do it for the case cage and the termination of several akatsuki terrorists said tsunade as the masked figure turned to face the giant boulder before placing his right gloved hand on the seal as quiet whispers filled the air that irked the onlookers as well as making them feel a hint of fear in the back of their minds even the emotionless Sai could not help but quiver at the shadow Ona's work. Removing his hand from the seal, the white paper turned black before burning to ash and scattered to the winds. Raising his right arm, it glowed with red and golden light as if it were a flame, before punching into the large rock that it shattered into pieces. Everyone was awestruck at the samurai's strength that it seemed to be almost equivalent to Tsunade's. Rushing forward, Amayuri pulled out her Kiba blades and ignited them with crackling blue electricity, as she followed her dark partner that already ran into the cave. Seeing the red-haired Kunoichi running and woke the others from their stupor as they charged in to help them out. Hum, sorry to burst your bubble, fools. But you were Ulreya, was all that Didera could say before Shadow Oni raised his arm again, only for a tendril of fire to form, creating a whip of flames that spun in the air before striking at the ghetto statue's face. The cave quaked as the statue wailed in agony as it received another lash on its body before it summoned itself back to the Akatsuki's hideout. The Akatsuki holograms and the two artists were bewildered that the statue could be wounded by such fiery techniques. Payne turned his Rinnegan gaze at this interloper and companions. How dare you get in the way of our goal for peace to all of the elemental nations? Shadow Oni gave a rumbling growl at Payne's remark. What a load of crap. If you think waking up Mummy Tree is going to get all of us to play nice, nice, then you are completely nuts. Especially with so many dark rings coming from those eyes of yours, you must not have slept in months. Said Amayuri. Payne did not seem to be agitated by the swordswoman's words, but inside Payne and Toby were startled that their plan was already known. Could they have a spy amongst them? No, Itachi and Jiraiya's spy network have not gotten wind of what will happen when the Moon Eye plan begins. Sasori, Didera, deal with them. We cannot allow their interference to continue, said Payne as the holograms disappeared. The two Akatsuki members turned to face their foes and prepared to destroy Lady Tsunade and her entourage. 
After the holograms of the Akatsuki vanished Ghidera creates a clay bird to ride on that swallows the body of Gara as he tries to escape into more open air to really let loose his art. Unfortunately he is prevented this when Amayuri uses her Kiba blades to electrocute the flying golem as the shadow Oni opens his hidden demonic wings to catch the case cage and then handing him to Lady Tsunade and Chio. The more shadow Oni showed the leaf and wind shinobi, the more intrigued they were. Sorry. But I've always wanted to hunt down a rogue Iwa that has a fetish for things that go boom. You old gals get clear and try to fix Mr. Sandman while me and my hot devil handle these worthless Akatsuki," said Amayuri. H.N. You think you can take me on? You washed up wannabe swordsman. Kisame has more bite than you ever will. Didera taunted to the only female swordsman of the Hidden Mists. Yeah. Well I just fried the big shark's puppet clone since he wasn't man enough to be here himself. So I'll take my anger out on you, Doughboy. Lightning style, Thundergate. The fanged woman then thrusts her hooked blades into the ground as lightning coursed through the water and earth throughout the cave. Tsunade and the others leapt out of the cave before the electricity could reach them while Shadow Oni and Sasori stared intently at one another, unharmed and without flinching from the sparks that flew around the cave before it exploded. Didera and his created clay dragon flew out of the smoke and following down the river with Amayuri in hot pursuit. Sasori was still standing his ground while Shadow Oni was unmoving and still like a statue. You are a strange one, Shadow Oni. To not only use fire that burns as bright as the fallen Pakuras, but also one that uses it that can harm a powerful object as the ghetto statue. You would certainly make a unique addition to my puppet collection. Sasori comments before preparing his poisoned scorpion tail and hidden senban needles while also readying his wire defenses. The still warrior suddenly moves as his eyes peer through his oni mask to show bright golden eyes that have no pupil or irises, just pure gold yellow. With a huff of breath like a bull ready to charge, Shadow Oni stalks forward as fire consumes his body. The hunchback fires his senban needles from the puppet's mouth, but they are all burnt to ashes before touching Shadow Oni's physical form. Next Sasori has his iron tail strike at the armored beast but the samurai uses his gloved hands to brush the tail away without worry. Sasori is surprised when he watches his poison steel wire catch on fire from Shadow Ona's chakra aura before it melts away, becoming harmless and useless. He wonders if his opponent may be able to contend with Itachi's infamous cursed Amaterasu flames. He didn't have to wait long as Shadow Oni lunged forward and created a flaming sword that was going to cleave the puppet master of the Akatsuki in two. Sasori used his scorpion-like tail to block the sword, but the power coursing through the fiery weapon overpowered it as one of his current puppets would soon be destroyed like unto his shattered tail. Sasori was forced to escape and bring out the big guns. Your flames are starting to annoy me. I recognize your power against my needles and poisons. But are you strong enough to face one of the best puppets in my collection? Sasori's true form revealed to be a young red head with brown eyes as he pulls out a summoning scroll to summon his most favorite of man turned puppets. The third case cage, the strongest case cage in Suna history. The puppet first showed its power by wielding a multitude of large sharp blades that have Shadow Oni jump back in self preservation. Seeing that using fire annoyed the puppet master, he keeps his flaming aura on to taunt Sasori and his precious collection of wooden dolls. The warrior then pulls out his sheathed darkened blade that had glowing symbols on it that had Sasori curious. As the two fought in the cave, Tsunade and the rest of the leaf shinobi were astounded that this shadow oni was able to contend against an S-rank Akatsuki. Sasuke was seething that this nobody ronin was stronger than he was currently. Kakashi was planning to inform Jiraiya and Danzo on this new development, while wondering what was keeping Sai from completing his mission towards Shizun since Sai was not back with the rest of them yet. The battle seemed to be turning in Sasori's favor when he unleashed thousands of iron puppet hands to pommel Shadow Oni into the ground. But still Shadow Oni refused to give up as his armor started to crumble. Calling on the darkness within the cave, Shadow Oni vanished from sight before his face could be revealed as Sasori tried to pinpoint his location. However, it proved pointless as the ronin proved a master in silent killing as the swordsman of the hidden mists, only shadows and darkness were utilized instead of damp mists. Sasori felt his heart stabbed through by the dark blade as the shadows rescinded and the cave was visible again. The puppet man turned to look into the eyes of the Akatsuki's future enemy and they widen in surprise. 
Sasori smiles before giving his final remarks as his body started to burn. To think after all this time, you would have survived after the Valley of the End incident. You have grown more powerful than what our spies had of you when you were a weak idealist Jinchuriki. I wonder who will win when you fight pain. The God of Rain versus the Demon of Shadow and Flame. Such a thing would be a wonderful work of art to immortalize. He remarked before the fires consumed him and the Akatsuki now were short one member. Maybe two. Amayuri versus Didera After Didera flew out of the cave, he kept himself in the air while Amayuri was in hot pursuit on the ground. Only getting some elevation when leaping onto giant tree trunks in between the ravine walls, she wasn't considered the most tenacious swordswoman that never lets her prey get away for nothing. H.N. You can't touch me from up here, runt. Didera jeered at the short woman as he prepped two clay bombs to nosedive at the pursuing Kunoichi. If there's two things you should know about Amayuri Ringo. 1. Don't mention her size. And 2. Don't make her bored by running away from her. It just makes her more angry and more relentless in her hunt. Bad move, fart face. She muttered as she used her lightning blades to cut the clay bombs to pieces. Their explosion being minimized by her lightning chakra nature. Which she is a master of. If I can't reach you from up there, then I will make you come down here. Lightning style. Lightning fang jutsu. Bolts a blue lightning race from her blades and towards the flying Akatsuki and his clay ride. The lightning hits Didera who becomes paralyzed by the attack as he falls to the water below with his clay dragon destroyed with a not so impressive boom. Didera tried to shake the paralysis off, but the water from the river made it difficult for him. Amayuri fires a thunderbolt using the lightning style. Thunderbolt Jutsu when Didera was in her vicinity. Didera cursed that he was now unable to move his hands to create more exploding clay that he must be forced to use his ultimate trump card. Unfortunately, Ringo was faster than him as she spun like a top in the air with her lightning still ablaze as she sliced and diced Didera into pieces. The Kunoichi inspected the broken body to be certain that it was really him and not some fake clone. Satisfied by her hunt, she hightailed it back to where Naruto and the others were so they could get the party started. Scene change Tsunade was stunned to see her godson's face after so many years. At first, she thought she was hallucinating after Sasori's burnt remains were thrown aside by Naruto's blade. But after seeing his blue eyes, whisker-marked face, and her grandfather's necklace still wrapped around his neck, she knew that this wasn't a dream. Kakashi was sweating at seeing the demon return from the underworld. Now looking older and stronger than before. Now that his shadow oni armor was destroyed the Kyubi brat now wore dark long-sleeved hooded coat with red, orange, and yellow flames dancing along the edges of the sleeves and bottom ridges. Under the coat was a black mesh shirt that went well with his black pants and black tool belt where he sheathed his sword. The belt buckle having a strange design with lots of blues and white silver with a gold ring in the background. A. And check out my cover image for Uzu Uden. If you can't see it, just picture a circle buckle with a Celtic knot ringed edge with a gold filler and in the center of the buckle is silver white with the bluish outline of the western gate of the mines of Moria, with added gold runes on the pillars that symbolize Naruto's Maiar status, which is also the symbol for Gandalf. Naruto? Is it really you? Asked Tsunade. It's me, Granny. Aren't you supposed to be sitting in an office doing Hokage work? Naruto chuckled. Tsunade could only smile as she rushes over to give him a senju hug as she cries for joy at this surprising miracle. Naruto's demonic strength being able to handle her hug as he in turn hugged her back. The two held each other like this for several minutes while the Leaf and San Shinobi could watch in awe and confusion. Guy and Lee wanting to express their youthfulness at this wondrous moment. This is the scene Shizune walked into when she came out from the forest with Naruto's companions, Kurama and Tayuya. Shizune was earlier cornered by Danzo's route after the team slid up in fighting Itachi and Kisami's doppelgangers. Sai was leading them as they were ordered to eliminate Tsunade's assistant and steal the senju belongings that Danzo wanted. For the good of Konoha. Thankfully, Tayuya and Kurama were Naruto's backup that he had watch over Shizune Nisan. The humanoid Biju and the ex-member of Sound Village made quick work of Sai and the other root agents that were Danzo's backup in case Tsunade was not terminated by Kakashi. But Amayuri was there for Tsunade. Speaking of which, the Kiri swordswoman made it back and joined up with her girls as they went to Lady Chio and Temuri's side where they were watching over Gara's unconscious body. 
having recovered thanks to Lady Tsunade and Chio's expertise but remained unresponsive. Tsunade released Naruto from her hug as she asked the million yen question. Why didn't you come back? We thought you were dead. I was dead. Thanks to Kakashi who finished the job at, as he put it, avenging his sensei, Tsunade glared at Kakashi for murdering Naruto. I've been sent back by Kami with the blessing of my father and mother, who I've met in the great beyond. They were not pleased with what Konoha has done to me, but now things will be different. I am Naruto the Dark. And I come back to you now, at the turn of the tide, said Naruto. You shouldn't have come back, loser, said Sasuke who was forming a Chidori in his right hand. You may have beaten me back then, but I am stronger now that I can prove to you that you will never be better than me. Sasuke then charges forward, only to be tripped into the water by Kurama who was showing her foxtails for all to see. Granny allow me to introduce you to my company, and love interests. Amiuri Ringo of the Seven Swordsmen of the Mists, Tayuya Uzumaki formerly of the Sound Four, and the top woman being Kurama, the Kayubi no Yoko. Naruto introduces the trio to Tsunade. Liar. This woman can't be the Biju. You are the Kayubi reincarnated. I never believed that you were the son of my sensei when Tsunade announced your heritage crap. For I am the son Minato sensei ever needed. Kakashi denied as he could not accept Minato giving birth to a demon by that Uzumaki harlot that hung around him. And that is why I will never understand humans that favor a clan that is cursed by their hatred induced Sharingan that turns them insane. Only Itachi and Kashina's friend Makoto were the ones that were not blinded by their hatred for anything that proved more powerful or special than the Uchiha. I can see that your implanted Sharingan has left the great Kakashi to abandon reason for madness, dog breath said Kurama who then revealed her fox ears and let her red eyes shine to further prove herself. Kakashi was in much confusion and disbelief as he stared between Naruto and the female foxwoman. Sakura was about to punch Kurama for tripping her precious Sasuke, only to be knocked to the ground by the kitsune's tails that were no longer restraining Sasuke. The Uchiha then got the idea that he should try controlling the Kayubi with his improved Sharingan. I am your master now, Kayubi. Submit to me as my ancestor Madara did before, Sasuke commanded as his red pinwheel eyes spun to life. However, Kurama had a lot of practice with Naruto and their fellowship to now resist genjutsu of any kind, including the hypnotizing Sharingan. The Kayubi decided that Konoha should learn the hard way that they were favoring a weak brat. Kurama punched the Uchiha in the stomach before using her clawed fingers to gauge out his eyes. Sasuke screamed in pain and anger that the Uchiha's most prized possession was lost. He snarled and tried to force her to give them back, but he stumbled and blindly tried to attack the Kayubi. Everyone had distanced form Sasuke as he yelled and cried for retribution. The answer given was having his eyes crushed and then burned by Kurama's red chakra. Kakashi was stunned by this before anger replaced it. You have destroyed the Sharingan of Konoha's last Uchiha. You will suffer. He then forms his Chidori to kill the Kayubi. Only for Naruto to come behind Kakashi and knock the former sensei unconscious with the pommel of his sword. Naruto then looks to the remaining Konoha ninja to give them a message. Take your ninja and return to the Warhawk and his lackeys with this message. The heir to Whirlpool has returned. And he will destroy the evil of the root by unleashing the flames of the true will of fire. Then shall he establish peace as the Uzumaki were meant to as the mediators amongst the entire elemental nations. Naruto informed Team Guy as they gathered Sakura, Sasuke, and Kakashi before vanishing in a large swirl of dancing leaves. That was something else, Naruto-kun. Makes me want to take you to a private hotel and eat you up, said Amayuri. Uh, uh. I am the top woman and I get to be Naruto's first before either you or Tuyuya can get a piece of him. Kurama putting her foot down. Not until I deem you all worthy of being with my godson, you perverted Kitsune. Jabs Tsunade as the ladies get into a fight that would soon turn into a bloodbath until Naruto lets his demonic features out and gives a Balrog bellow to shut them up. No one is getting a piece of me yet. One step of our journey is over, and another begins. I need to get my inheritance from my parents' compound. Then we are to hide and help Inkiri rebuild so that they can help Wave in rebuilding Uzushio. After that, we can plan on what to do next before the Akatsuki strike again. But how are you going to get there when Danzo will probably have Konoha locked down and sending Root and Leafnin to hunt us down? 
he must have realized that I took not only my Senju belongings but the scroll of ceilings as well, said Tsunade. I have my ways. I am the master of fire and shadows. I know how to wield them in ways others cannot comprehend. Now though is not the time. I wish to wake my friend Gara from his slumber and if possible, sojourn in Suna with my growing group. Naruto directs this to Tamari and Lady Chio. We would be happy and honored to have you stay in Suna for a time, Naruto. But Gara has been put into a coma that not even Lady Chio can wake him from it. Tamari told him. Naruto simply smiled before he walked on over and knelt by Gara. He then places a hand over Gara's face as he murmurs quietly. No one could understand him, but the three redhead Kunoichi knew what would happen next. After removing his hand from his best friend Naruto waited. Gara began to stir as he slowly opened his eyes and looks to his left to see his sister. I know your face, Tamari, Tamari. Sand Nin searchers came into the clearing to find their case cage safe and well. Tamari was so glad to have her brother back. When Naruto died those years ago, he kept to himself mostly and rarely slept due to having nightmares of Naruto saying that he could not save him when he saw from a distance Kakashi delivering the final blow. He knew that Tsunade could do nothing as Hokage while those advisors that favored Sasuke and his Sharingan, nor could he speak up or else damage Suna more while Konoha reaped the rewards, so he stayed silent, pushing those he loved away so they wouldn't fall into his same abyss. When he looked around, he recognized the faces of Lady Chio, Lady Tsunade, Shizun, and Tuyuya were there too. It was when he saw Naruto that he truly was surprised. Naruto? Gara took in the Uzumaki's new look and hairstyle, demonic horns, wings, and tail. Breathe the free air again, my friend. Naruto simply said before reaching his arm out so Gara could take it. The fifth case cage grabbed his friend's hand as Tamari also helped in picking him up on his feet. Suna Shinobi, Team Uzumaki, the Senju duo, and the old advisor of Suna stood ready for the return of the leader of the hidden village of the Sands. Gara did not know how, but he knew somehow Naruto rescued him, again. In a more miraculous way than at the end of the sound, sand invasion. Dark have been my dreams of late. Gara stares at his shivering hands feeling as if he has not used chakra in a long time. Your fingers and body would remember their old strength better if they grasp your gourd, commented Naruto. Lady Chio pulls out a scroll of ceiling as she frees Gara's giant gourd of sand that he once had strapped to his back. Gara slowly reaches for the top of the giant gourd to uncork it. He then feels the gourd with hands before concentrating on his chakra once again. He feels the minerals of the earth and within the gourd rise as he lets his chakra flow through him again. Tamari and Lady Chio were happy as they saw Gara was now levitating off the ground with a layer of sand surrounding his feet that was levitating midair. Gara opened his eyes to see sand fly all around him before as he gapes in awe. The sand then flew into his gourd before the cork sealed it up as Gara descended and looked back to his old friend before giving him a handshake. Naruto being his cheerful self surprisingly brought Gara in closer as he gave him a brotherly hug. Gara was shocked by Naruto's action, but he smiled at that. Reminding himself that his unpredictable friend was back and not about to die a second time around. Anytime soon. Scene change, three days later. What? The Kyubi Jinchuriki is back. And to make matters worse, he has a demon foxwoman with him, the wielder of the Kiba Blades, a member of Orochimaru's elite force and now the Senju and her apprentice have joined forces with him. This is not good for Konoha. Danzo remarked in the council room with the Konoha council gathered along with Team Guy to report on what happened to the Kaze Cage rescue mission. When they made it back to the village to the village, the advisors rushed the bleeding unconscious Sasuke to the hospital while Guy and Lee carried Kakashi and Sakura on their backs. After the members of Team 7 were put under the doctor's care Danzo, now self-proclaimed Hokage of Konoha, ordered the team to report on the mission. Guy had Danzo make an emergency meeting with the Shinobi Council, with the civilian council tagging along to hear how their precious Sasuke was hurt so badly. The news they were given were not pleasing to the Warhawk or those that favored the Uchiha and despised the Uzumaki. We need to launch an immediate attack on Suna for harboring fugitives and make them pay for turning their backs fully on Konoha, their one and only allies. Homura voiced with many on the civilian council banging their fists in agreement. Troublesome. We already have lost a good portion of our forces and stock due to the demon brat's death. 
The Jinchuriki's return will now likely have Suna cut ties with us like Wave, Snow, Spring, and the Moon Kingdom have done. It is we who need allies. The Nara clan head, Shikaku pointed out to everyone. We should have had the brat killed before he became a genin. That fox brought nothing but trouble while my hounds and clan members hunted for him in the past. Remarks Soom. Having hated Naruto for getting Kashina killed and his annoying pranks and quirks that messed with her clan's senses and made their scouting, hunting dynamic look weak to the rest of Fire Country. Especially during that Kumo, Hyuga incident. The past is the past. We must now focus on the present so Konoha can rise again from the ashes. Can we not take the Jinchuriki from Taki so we can have a weapon should Kumo or Iwa attack us? Asked Danzo. Unfortunately, the Akatsuki have already abducted her. So there are no Jinchuriki available for Konoha. But my spies have heard rumors of the Three Tails making a reappearance and is wandering freely somewhere in Kiri. But I recommend that we try and get Naruto back to our side. He will want to come claims his inheritance once Tsunade tells him about his parents. Suggested Jiraiya. Jiraiya may be Naruto's godfather, but his duty comes to Konoha first since the Leaf Village's situation looked grim. Especially with Tsunade no longer a part of her grandfather's village again. This time traveling with Naruto and his interesting companions. He didn't believe the foxwoman guy described was the Kyubi in human form. Biju were beasts, plain and simple, and their only roles were to keep the peace between the five great nations while Naruto would have to be re-guided to bringing peace to the world while keeping Konoha intact. The council murmured in agreement as they formulated their plan with Danzo approving of trapping the Jinchuriki once he steps foot in Konoha. Allowing the council to claim the knowledge and riches of the Uzumaki and Namikaze clans that not even Jiraiya could get to since Kashina added some seals, while leaving the demon brat with nothing. Only to listen and obey to Danzo's word as the Hokage of Konoha. While Konoha was scheming, Naruto was showing Suna the beauty of fireworks as they celebrated Gara's return as the recovered case cage. Tsunade was enjoying the liquor and festivities of the desert dwelling shinobi, with Shizun looking at festival dresses that were enhance her figure. Gara and his siblings were enjoying themselves watching their old friend fire off sparkling flames that danced in the air and sometimes played with the younger genin of Suna. Naruto was happy at the joy all Suna and his granny and sister figure were having tonight. But he was wondering where Karama, Amayuri, and Tayuya wandered off to. Having taken the last few days for everyone to recuperate and finalize their plan for Naruto and his fellowship's journey after the party. It was then he got his answer after firing his firework that took the form of Gord surrounded by a tanuki that looked like Shukaku that he got the answer to his missing mate's inquiry. The crowd gathered to a wooden stage that had its curtains down as lights were beaming at them. Naruto decided to go see what this show would bring after leaving his fireworks cart unattended. As three small figures snuck in to find the biggest firework ever to announce their arrival to boss. Music began to play as the curtains rose to reveal the Uzumaki's three women adorned in Suna dancer outfits as they performed a belly dance to Naruto's pleasure with the crowd cheering them on. Naruto was blushing dark red with some blood seeping from his nose as he saw how beautiful the trio looked. Karama wearing an orange top that showed off her ample chest with a revealing long skirt that had red strings that matched the red flowers that were worn near her elven ears. Tayuya and Amiuri were wearing matching black dancer outfits with orange lines, designs as they spun and danced beside the middle kitsune. A. N. For Karama, think FGO Matahari's final form outfit, while Tayuya and Amiuri are wearing Deviantart Rocky Ace's Makoto dancer outfit with orange instead of blue and without the string connected to the choker. Gara was happy that Naruto had strong, beautiful women that showed their love for him by performing this dance while teasing the demonic Uzumaki to take the next steps in their relationship. Tamari, Konkuro, Tsunade, and Shizune were jealous for different reasons. For Konkuro it was Naruto for being a lucky dog to bag such hotties, while the princesses and apprentice were twitching with envy at those hussies in stealing Naruto from them. When the music ended and the dancers gave a final sexy pose, the crowd roared with hollers and clapping at the amazing performance the trio gave. The three gave a bow before jumping off stage to hug their loving Naruto who was awestruck, not knowing what to say as they pressed their bodies into his arms and chest. Did you love our dance, Naruto-kun? Kurama asked as she pressed her cleavage closer to his chest. Why why yes. You all were fantastic. I did not know you three could dance said Naruto. 
feeling that his body parts stiffen as he felt like he was about to hit Cloud Nine. As much as I hate to admit it, Flame Head. The vixen learned from past experiences before being sealed into her first Jinchuriki. After winning the place as top wife, she taught Sparky and I in secret so we could surprise you when the time was right," said Tuyuya as she laid her head on his left shoulder as she blew into his left ear with Ringo doing the same to his right. It looks like we succeeded in surprising you, Oni-kun. When can we expect you to reward us for our combined present? Asked the sharp-toothed redhead as Naruto was not able to answer them. Not tonight, you hussies. I am, not ready, for you to take my, honorary grandson away. Tsunade slurred as she tried pulling Naruto into her bosom. Shizune having to try and pry a drunk Tsunade so she cannot make the scene worse as the Senju started tearing up at seeing her precious Naruto grow up so fast. Suddenly, the moment was interrupted when a tent flew up into the sky as a trail or orange fire sparked behind it. Naruto recognized it as his draconic firework that somehow was stolen from his cart. He turned to where the firework blasted off from as he could make out black spiky hair from a smoking young man with two accomplices. Naruto snuck away from his female companions as they were distracted along with the rest of the people of Suna as the firework exploded into orange and white light that continued to rise, forming a dragon head as it roared before sparking its full form as it descended towards the unexpecting crowd. Everyone began to worry as it continued to glide down towards them with its large sparkling membrane wings with its eyes and mouth glowing at them. Some of the crowd started running away from the dragon, toppling over festival tables and carts while they did so. The case cage ordered the rest of them to duck and cover as his anbu and several others had the people lay on their bellies against the sandy ground as the animated fire flew over them. Once the animated dragon flew past them, they lifted their heads to see what would happen next. The dragon rose to the sky again as it turned back into a streaming orange comet. When it reached high enough into the sky, it exploded into flurry of multiple fireworks that boomed loudly into the starry sky. The mood quickly changed as the crowd cheered and clapped at the display with Kurama and the others staring in awe at Naruto having such a surprising firework do that. The group responsible for this were the grown-up Genin, the Konohamaru Army Corps along with the Hyuga Eris, Konohamaru Serutobi, Udon, Moegi, and Hanabi Hayuga. Having slipped out of Konoha after hearing that the boss had returned and was going to put the usurper Danzo down. The grandson of the third never liked the Warhawk or the decisions of the former teammates of Hiruzen. As soon as Lady Tsunade left with Team 7 before she could relinquish the Hokage seat to someone else, Danzo got the approval of the majority of the civilian and shinobi councils to instate him as the new current Hokage. Ebisu knew that the legacy of the third and his teammates would be forced to undergo root training as Danzo made it clear that he wanted to re-establish the foundation to bolster Konoha's ranks. The first target being young orphans before he would petition the Genin and Academy students to also undergo training to remove meaningless emotions in the sixth Hokage's view. Ebisu helped Konohamaru escape with his comrades and secret girlfriend as Hanada also wished for her sister to be safe while she waited in hiding for Naruto near the fourth Hokage's residence, wanting to proclaim her love for him while making sure she protected the legacy of the Hokage from root seal agents that tried to mess with the gate's seal with Jiraiya unaware as he was preparing a seal to capture Naruto. They had wanted to surprise him by using one of Naruto's firework creations. Unfortunately, they did not know how it worked after lighting it up inside their tent as Udon and Konohamaru argued on how they should make their entrance. The result had the two shinobi knocked onto their backs with soot covering them with Kunoichi coughing up a storm as they watched the firework magically turn into a dragon as cause chaos that they did not want to happen. Hanabi and Moegi felt the presence of someone behind them as they were nervous at seeing the towering form of Naruto glowering down at them. The two were about to voice their surprise when Naruto gave them a smile before shushing them to silence and had them watch the end of the firework show that Konohamaru and Udon were too distracted by as Naruto snuck up behind them. The Kunoichi smirked as they watched Naruto about to surprise their dummy boyfriends, enjoying the fireworks and the humiliation coming up. That was awesome, said Udon, wiping the soot off his glasses. Let's get another one, said Konohamaru to Udon. Until the two genin felt their ears being pinched by strong fingers as they yelped in surprise and pain before squinting up to look at their captor. Udon eyes. And Konohamaru Serutobi. I might have known. Naruto spoke in a stern tone before dragging them towards Lady Tsunade and the rest of the group with Hanabi and Moegi following behind Naruto. 
Scene change, are you serious? Hanada likes me? And she's putting her life in danger to protect my parents' home until I return to claim it. Naruto was floored at the shy Hyuga from the Chunin exams having such a crush on him. Only to get smacked by Tsunade for Naruto not seeing the rest of the picture. You numbskull. Worry about her feelings for you later. What is more concerning is how Danzo got to be Hokage so quickly. What did the fire daimyo have to say? She asked the four genin. The daimyo came to Konoha just a day after you left with Team 7. It was then he gathered the council, and the advisors voiced their opinion of giving the office to Danzo after saying that you had quit. I was there with Uncle Asuma to see what my future duties would be as the Serutobi heir before I became future Hokage. Konohamaru explained with Hanabi filling in as well since she too was there with Hinata and their father Hiyashi Hayuga. The fire daimyo was about to request that a squad of Anbu to pick up Lady Tsunade once the retrieval mission was finished, to hear her side of things, but something strange happened. Danzo rebuked the daimyo and somehow convinced him that the Senju princess had turned traitor and did not deserve to be heard or continue leading Konoha into ruin. That is when Danzo got the majority vote of being elected the sixth Hokage. However, I got suspicious and quietly activated my Byakugan and saw it. Hanabi paused before sharing the secret Danzo has been hiding from the village and the Hokage. The elder had an implanted Sharingan where his bandaged covered eyes, as well as multiple Sharingan implanted on his hidden arm that looked to made of different chakra than his. He must have used a powerful Genjutsu to influence the Fire Daimyo and the Shinobi Council to get them to accept his election. I whispered this to Tu San, which is why he accepted Hanada's plan in allowing me to join the Konohamaru Army Corp to Suna to warn Lady Tsunade and the returned Uzumaki. Hanabi's revelation threw everyone in the room for a loop. That grave robber. Tsunade smashed fist against the wall. Please, calm yourself, Lady Tsunade. Shizun rubbed her sensei's shoulders to calm her down. I never liked that old man that seemed to glance at Naruto-kun like he was some sort of prize to be won while I was sealed inside of him. Kurama noted from watching through Naruto's eyes when she was sealed inside of him. I'm not sure if you want to hear this, but when I was a part of the Sound 4, Orochimaru had dealings with that mummy that got us to infiltrate Konoha during the Chunin exams. The payment being that arm full of Sharingan since the pedophile wanted a full-blooded living Uchiha to claim the Sharingan. The arm is made of Hashirama Senju cells, which makes Danzo a two-time grave robber. To Yuya added, the trio having foregone their dancer outfits and wearing kimonos to cover themselves now that this news had ruined their romantic teasing from earlier. So what are we going to do, boss? Konohamaru asked at seeing Naruto ponder on things. This is but a test of the terror the Warhawk will unleash on the elemental nations. What he really wants is a Jinchuriki or a powerful Biju. All the more potent that his fears of the Akatsuki and their plans in claiming the remaining tailed beasts to destroy his vision of Konoha and the elemental nations at large that is driving his madness. I will go and reclaim my birthright along with Hinata while allowing those who wish to not follow Danzo and his madness to escape. Says Naruto. But Naruto. What if Danzo and the council are expecting you? It could be a trap. Unless you count Jiraiya as another ally. Did my teammate try to do anything to stop Danzo's foundation regiment? Tsunade asked. No strangely. Yet last we heard, he was working on a seal for Naruto especially. Even when it was him that suggested they try to get Naruto back on Kanaha's good side. Udon spoke up. Then he is our enemy. I travel to Konoha. Gara. Have your trusted Anbu prepare for refugees along the fire and wind border. Naruto proclaims. Before Tsunade and the others could retort Naruto, he vanished in the darkness of the shadows. Seeing this new ability surprised them except for Kurama and the other girls. I think while Gara prepares his Anbu, we should take a peek through that scrying ball all cage have to see what Naruto plans to do in springing their trap. Kurama suggests with everyone running around to finish their tasks so that they could watch Naruto bring chaos to the cesspool of a village. Konoha, nighttime. Hanada was getting tired as two root agents remained standing as she stood guard in front of the Namikaze Uzumaki compound. They always came by at night to try and weaken the seals on the closed gates. Which meant Hanada was always the Uzumaki's guardian angel of the night so that her longtime crush and love interest can claim his inheritance without political interference. However, 
They sent more tonight which sapped more of her strength than usual. Surrender. And Lord Hokage will put your skills to better service the hidden leaf. One of the agents told her. The Byakugan and the Hyuga clan are not pawns in the Warhawks games for the five great nations. Nor are the jutsus and secrets within this compound are his to take. They belong to the clan heir of the fourth Hokage and the Uzumaki clan, Hanada declared. Fortunately, the Hyuga have accepted Lord Donzo's ruling and have proven their loyalty by reinstating the Hyuga elders as the leaders of the clan. The other root agent explained in a monotone voice which shocked Hyuga princess. How? My father is the one leader of the Hyuga clan. Hiyashi Hyuga has been disposed of tonight for betraying Konoha. Allowing the Serutobi heir and his genin team to flee along with your sister days ago. Once we restrain you, you will serve your village and Hokage by ending those traitors and then to be bred to repopulate the Byakugan for the good of the village. Hanada was abhorred that her father was assassinated and now Neji and the rest of the branch members were in danger. Before the two root could use this moment of distraction to capture Hanada, the shadows behind them stirred as a dark blade was alit with flames. Beheading the two unawares. Stepping out of the shadows, Naruto walked on over to Hanada who was about to faint in surprise and fatigue. And Naruto? Is it really you? Stuttered Hanada. It's me, Hanada. I thought you had grown out of stuttering after my first passing. Naruto teased which had Hanada blushing red. Calm yourself. Your sister told me everything. I am sorry I did not realize your feelings for me earlier in our genin days. Know that I am currently in a relationship with three other women who wish to help in bringing back my clan and fighting our true enemy. Are you willing to share the burden that I bear? Naruto asked. Hanada was silent as she was sad that she was not the only one to now have feelings for Naruto-kun. But she also knew how big Naruto's heart was and seeing that he wanted to bring back his clan. Hanada was happy that she had the chance to be a part of Naruto's growing family. She nodded her head to show she wanted this. So be it. Then you need to regain your strength for the long journey, said Naruto. What do you mean? Hanada asked. Her answer being the coming figure of her cousin, Neji. The sight of her cousin alive overwhelmed her to unconsciousness. Thank you, Naruto for saving Hyuga branch and my fellow sibling. Danzo will be furious when he finds out you slaughtered the Hyuga elders and the main family that followed their way of thinking, said Neji. Naruto having first appeared in the shadows of the Hyuga compound to see if he could find Hanada there. Only to find that the Hyuga elders had killed the clan head and were about to send some of their members to apprehend Neji and Hanada to be indoctrinated to Danzo's route. Naruto rescued Neji as the two allied in ending the elders, much to Neji's joy for his father's and uncle's memory. That and more, my friend. I am going to set a fire under Danzo and Konoha. While I distract them, you must get Hanada, Team Guy, and your remaining clan to Suna's borders. They will protect you, with Hanabi and the others waiting for you all. Naruto instructed him. Understood. Neji then summons a few clones to get Guy Sensei, Lee, and Tenten while the original carried Hanada to where the remaining Hyuga had gathered to begin their escape. Naruto then shifts his gaze towards his parents' compound as he releases the seal and enters the compound after having shut the gates behind him. The former ninja of the leaf walked slowly as he took in the sight of the place that was meant to be his home and sanctuary. So many promises that were broken because of the selfishness and hatred of Konoha council members. Opening the door he sends clouds of dust flying everywhere. Tears start to form in his eyes, whether it is because of the dust bunnies or the thoughts of what could have been who could say. He needed to work fast before getting Danzo and his failure of a godfather's attention. While this was happening, Jiraiya had just entered the Hokage's office where Danzo was waiting to hear the results of his fuinjutsu. I finally finished. This seal should hold Naruto long enough for you and me to reconvince him Konoha is his home. He will never rebel against it again. Jiraiya explained to Danzo. That is good news, Jiraiya. I believe we should see him in the a few days. Enough time to prepare for more countermeasures if the Uzumaki does something unpredictable. Danzo thinking of some backup plans. What about Sasuke, Sakura, and Kakashi? Jiraiya asks the former Team 7. The Uchiha will need to have his eyes replaced if he is to defeat Itachi should the former spy ever return. Perhaps Hitaki would be generous to donate that eye he has kept for all these years. It would serve Sasuke better than that lazy man. 
Danzo commented. Suddenly, an Anbu appeared in the room before giving a silent bow before reporting. Lord Sixth, emergency. Someone has infiltrated the Uzumaki, Namikaze compound and has set it on fire. The Toad Sage and the Hokage were stunned at such a ridiculous claim. The two rushed out of the Hokage Tower to see for themselves. A few minutes later, a giant crowd had formed of civilians and shinobi as they were stumped at seeing the house of their great hero being burned behind sealed gates. Some shinobi even tried firing water jutsu over the gate to put out the flames. Only the jutsus were blocked by the powerful fuenjutsu that prevented jutsu or unwanted entry into the compound. This is terrible. All the secrets of the fourth and the Uzumaki will be lost. Cried Homura, who was with Danzo and Kaharu as they were awakened to the smell of smoke. Jiraiya, did your student leave you anything else in case something like this happened? Kaharu asked. No only copies of the Rasengan and the Flying Thunder God technique which for the second move I cannot perform. The real question is, who could have done this when I haven't even cracked the seal that looks intact? Jiraiya wonders. His answer came when a rumbling sound came from the flames and smoke of the burning house. It then turned into a roar that had everyone step back in fear, while not being able to see what was making that noise. Suddenly, a giant figure rose out of the flames and smoke as it descended a few feet away from the gate. Its wings were flared as its dark body emitted smoke and flames without looking hurt or in pain. Danzo and the village were startled that this demon was nothing like the Biju or even the nine-tailed fox that attacked them years ago. This was something new, and it irked Danzo to have a new piece appear on the board of his future conquest. He removed his bandages to reveal Shisui's powerful Sharingan to try and to turn the Oni docile. However, the eyes of the Balrog were only pure bright whites that showed no pupils. The ram-horned beast let out a hot roar at Danzo as the heat of the Balrog's breath forced the Warhawk to cancel his genjutsu at feeling pain in his injured eye while his skin felt like it was sweating immensely. The Balrog then created a flaming sword in his hand before thrusting it downwards onto the gate. Destroying the seal along with the entrance of the home as flames began to spread from the shadowy beast and towards the frightful population. Jiraiya would not let this stand along with Kakashi who was distraught at seeing his sensei's home destroyed by this monster. The Balrog took one step forward to make them think that Naruto was about to attack them. Waiting for Jiraiya to summon the toads to get them to boil in their sweaty mucus. Kakashi went and fired a large water dragon jutsu to extinguish Naruto's flame before preparing the stab Naruto with Minato's signature kanai. The blade barely pierced his skin as Naruto erupted in flames again before swiping Kakashi away. Destroying the kanai in the process is to relinquish Kakashi of his sensei's memento. His gaze turning toward Jiraiya who was now on Gamabunta who was confused at to see this. Jiraiya, what is going on? What is that demon? It looks like a winged oni, but nothing I've ever seen before. The toad boss commented. It has somehow gotten past Minato and Kushina's seals and has destroyed their home. The memory of my student must not be defiled any longer by its presence. Pervy Sage tells Gamabunta. I see. This may prove an interesting challenge. The giant summon pulls out his blade before jumping high into the air to plunge his sword into Naruto. Naruto was not worried the least as he easily dodged the crater made strike before changing his sword into his signature whip with flaming tongs. The toad was in excruciating pain at feeling the sting of the burning ends of the whip that left more scars on his body. Jiraiya tried to help in trapping the Balrog in a swamp, but the wings allowed him to fly out of the trap. It's just toying with us. Gamabunta noticed as Jiraiya regrouped on top of his head. What are you? Jiraiya shouted in anger. It was then the fire and smoke surrounding the Balrog enveloped him as he reverted to his humanoid form. Naruto stepped out with his horns tail, and wings out and adorned in his dark robes that had no signs of any burn on the material. The look on their faces was priceless to see. Hello Konoha. And in answer to your question, O oh godfather of mine. I am a Balrog. A demon of Konoha's creation from their deceitful shadows and their flames of hatred. A being of shadow and flame. Naruto declares to them. It's back. Hokage save us. The demon has come for revenge. The villagers shouted one to another as they showed mixtures of worry, anger, but mostly fear. Boy. What is the meaning of this? 
I thought Jiraiya was meant to train you like your father before you. Gamabunta said, showing his confusion. He only wants to train me so he can fulfill your prophecy that will only benefit Konoha. I have been brought back by Kami who wishes that all the elemental nations to have peace. It is not up to people to dictate how the prophecy influences them, it is their actions and the good or bad choices they make that will determine if they face destruction or prosperity. Konoha has been leaning on the destruction side ever since my parents died and not even my first death could get the leaf to stop in their bad habits. Naruto explains to the boss summon. Naruto, your father would not want you to destroy the home he sacrificed to make certain both you and Konoha could live past the Kyubi's rampage. Please, we can work this out. Jiraiya pleaded to Naruto. Naruto frowned at his former sensei. Would you be saying that if I no longer carried the Kyubi? Well guess what, I no longer am a Jinchuriki. The Kyubi is free, as all Biju should be since they are the nature guardians of the elemental nations. The only reason the fox went on a rampage is because an Uchiha used a Sharingan like Madeiras to force the Biju to attack Konoha in the first place. There can be no peace until the Akatsuki are stopped and the Biju are no longer turned captives to humans or hidden villages. That would go against everything the first Hokage did, Naruto. I will not let you destroy Konoha or her reputation for not having a happy childhood. Grow up. Jiraiya was losing it. Grow up. Tell me, Godfather. When did Jiraiya the gallant abandon reason for madness? Naruto retorted. At that, Jiraiya dashed towards Naruto with a Rasengan in hand. Only to slip on a sheet of slick ice that Naruto created with his water and wind chakra. Having pervy sage land awkwardly on his back that ended his signature move and prevented him from using his created seal, that Naruto effortlessly burned to a crisp. Seeing that he had distracted Danzo and everyone long enough, Naruto decided to leave a few final gifts before returning to Granny and the others. To their surprise, Naruto formed a Rasengan in one hand, but now completed with wind blades swirling around it with his demonic fire to make it more deadly. The Namikaze heir then flung his Uden Rasenshuriken into the Hokage mountain as it destroyed the faces of the first and second Hokage, while also causing the construction of Donzo's face to crumble as well. But that was not the end. Changing back into his 20 feet tall Balrog form, Naruto flapped his wings as climbed high into the air. When he reached high enough, he fell sending a seismic attack that had many civilians and shinobi crumble to the ground while also destroying many hidden passages of Donzo's root bunkers below the surface. His work finished, Naruto vanished in a swirl of fire and smoke, leaving Konoha in a more crippling state, far surpassing what the Kurama had done in the past. Gamabunta was stunned at how far off the path Jiraiya has fallen to reinterpret the Toad Sage's prophecy that was privileged to share. He reverse summoned himself back to Mount Myoboku to inform the other toads of Jiraiya and Konoha's actions of late. This cannot be. If word gets out of Konoha's state before the cage summit, I will be a laughingstock. No. I am the sixth Hokage. I will surpass the foolish cage of the past and bring about change. Not even the Akatsuki will be strong enough to fight against the might of the five great nations. With me leading them. Danzo thought to himself as he had his remaining forces begin extinguishing the flames that were now scattered across Konoha. It had been over a week since the case cage accepted a good host of Konoha's refugees that escaped Danzo's tyranny. It made Gara inwardly smile that Konoha was getting their comeuppance by having to deal with the fallout of another demon attack. He would be sure to mention this to the other cage after Naruto makes his entrance. Having left Lady Tsunade in charge of Suna and their Konoha refugees. Gara sat with the rakage I, Mizukage Mei Terumi, Suchikage Onoki, and finally Danzo the, Hokage. All while waiting for their host, Lord Mifune of Iron Country, to begin this cage summit. He kept a neutral face as he sat beside the Danzo, that was sitting in the center of the room. As if he were the present leader of the five great nations. Gara's siblings, Tamari and Konkuro, sat on the ledge above with the other cage bodyguards. Danzo having chosen Kakashi and a somewhat healed Sasuke who kept a frown after only having one Sharingan eye that Kakashi had provided him. Yet still the Uchiha believed himself above everyone else even with his eye patch covering that made him look like a mixture of both a younger Kakashi and Danzo. The delegations were getting anxious on when the discussions would begin. 
hoping to figure out how to stop these Akatsuki that now proved more of a threat now that A's brother, B the Jinchuriki of the Eight Tails, had been taken. Yet this gathering should have happened earlier when Gara had Shukaku removed from his body. It is unheard of a biju being stripped from a living host and into some weird large wooden statue. Just when the cage had their bodyguards prepare to defend their leaders after their bickering, Lord Mifune entered with two of his masked samurai. Cease this at once. This is neutral territory, and I will have none of your shinobi foolery until we can come to a concrete conclusion to what is to be done regarding these past troubling days. Lord Mifune spoke with no fear to the five powerful cage and their guards. One by one, the cage had their guards stand down as they started the meeting. It is true. These are perilous times with all our Jinchuriki having been taken by these terrorists known as the Akatsuki. Yet it seems only Kumo has little to no affiliation with them. Unlike the Hokage, Mizukage, Kei's Cage, and Tsuchikage that have rogue shinobi that make up the Akatsuki ranks. As such I propose a combined coalition led by myself to take down the threat before they unleash whatever weapon they have that requires the chakra of all nine-tailed beasts. I starts off, getting to the main topic of their gathering. However, Onoki was the oldest and more experienced of the other leaders. Regardless of his physical health issues, it is true we had hired the Akatsuki in the past, for they were cheap and allowed us to prevent your lust for bloodlines from entering further into stone country yet we have a good knowledge of who are among their numbers except their leader. If only we had some way of learning of who this mastermind is that could blindside the five great nations. It was then Danzo decided to make himself known, while planning to use Shisui's Sharingan that had fully recovered to influence the presiding samurai. In that case, there is a statement I have been waiting to make. What is it? I asked Danzo. From my sources, the true leader of the Akatsuki, is probably Madara Uchiha. His answer causes everyone to react at his remark. Impossible. I know of Madara's power when he fought against me in Iwa. But Hashirama's power was strong enough to counter and put down the madman. Onoki shares with the cage. I would advise not underestimating the power of the Uchiha. Sasuke speaks up while looking to Danzo who nodded in permission to let him continue. I may have been handicapped when I lost my eyes to a filthy foxwoman but Kakshi Sensei has given me his eye to return my sight. Which I have used to scour the secrets of my clan that I had for too long left alone in honor of my father and fallen brethren. Just before we had left Konoha after suffering from a fire disaster, I came across one finding. Stating that there is a forbidden jutsu of the Sharingan that can in theory allow the wielder to cheat death. Known as the Izanagi. A terrifying genjutsu that can warp reality itself. Sasuke shared with the cage. And what is the price of using this powerful genjutsu that could have fooled the world itself of Madara Uchiha's demise? Onoki asks. The cost being a large input of chakra as well as having one eye of the Sharingan to go blind. Making it a very risky jutsu that can only be used twice if I had both of my Sharingan eyes. Sasuke huffed at being reminded of his current disability. The case cage, Mizukage. Reikage, and Tsuchikage were shocked at this possibility of the rising of this warmongering ghost of Madara. Danzo taking the chance to begin using another ability of the Sharingan, the Kotoamatsukami, to manipulate Lord Mifune to make Danzo the leader of this shinobi alliance. Fortunately, that process was halted when a samurai had entered the room. Whispering to Mifune of something that caught the cage's attention, he nodded to the soldier to let them in before sharing with the five cage. It seems we have guests who wish to contribute to this cage summit. Who? May asked. See for yourselves. Mifune directs them to the doorway. The double doors opening to reveal a soldier giving a bow before stepping aside to reveal Naruto with his hood up. Along with Tayuya, Kurama, and Amayuri in battle kimonos. Having given up their weapons to the samurai protecting the building leaving Naruto with only his staff which he feigned to use as a walking stick as Kurama held his one open arm to achieve the illusion. Ao and Chojuro recognize their fellow swordswoman that seems to have recovered from her illness. Sasuke scowled at seeing the black attire loser and the former member of the Sound Four. Danzo frowned when looking at Kurama who had her fox ears and tail hidden. Alerting his hidden root that were monitoring the meeting, Danzo prepares to decide whether to use Shisui's eye on the last Jinchuriki or continue with his plan with Lord Mifune. 
He concludes that he will go for Naruto first so he can obtain his long-lost weapon and get the other cage to bow to his whim. Not knowing Kurama and Naruto had already sensed the Warhawks drones and ready their fellow lovers. The courtesy of your hall is somewhat lessened of late, Lord Mifune. Naruto speaks up from under his hood. Apologies, Uzumaki-sama. The threat of terrorists at my borders and to the coming of the leaders of the five great nations that are mostly filled with fear after learning of the supposed leader of the Akatsuki. My lords and lady, please welcome Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze and his entourage. Onoki and I were shocked at seeing this cloaked young man being the son of the infamous Yellow Flash. Danzo could not sit back any longer as he went forward in capturing the Kyubi brat that somehow made the rest of Konoha believe he had turned into some flaming shadow oni. The sixth Hokage refused to believe it and chalked it up as a fluke that the now Jinchuriki was declawed and vulnerable. Why should I welcome you? Late is the hour in which the last living Jinchuriki chooses to appear. Where were you when preventing the third Hokage's failed sacrifice? When the last Senju succumbed to her weak emotions and abandoned her village to serve this inexperienced case cage. Your questionable presence makes you a questionable guest. Danzo sneered. Be silent. Keep your forked tongue behind your teeth, Shadow Warmonger. I have not passed through fire and death to bandy crooked words with a witless worm. I come to inform that there is a presence hidden amongst you. Naruto says as the cage looked to one another in suspicion except the Mizukage who seemed to be in a blank-like state. What are you babbling about, child? Onoki wondered aloud as he tried to scan the supposed progeny of Minato. A spy has been seeing and hearing this meeting. Having cast a powerful genjutsu like one her predecessor was also a victim to in the civil war he was forced to mandate. With your permission, I will force our shady interloper into the spotlight and free the beautiful Mizukage from the spell. Naruto lets go of Kurama and removes his hood to reveal his face and horns much to everyone's surprise. Ao is shocked at this accusation and uses his hidden Byakugan to refute it. However, when he looks at his Mizukage, he sees foreign chakra knot of her own covering her eyes and brain. Similar to how he saw Yagura before he was defeated as the chakra left his body, and he accepted death. Knowing Chojuro would attack Naruto's company to protect his lady's honor, Ao holds him back as he quietly lets the Uzumaki know that he can go ahead to save Meitarumi. Danzo sternly wonders at how the Uzumaki planned to break a powerful genjutsu that could work like his Koto Amatsukami. His eye widens when he looks at the black staff in Naruto's hand and connects the dots. Summoning his root to remove the one thing that can prevent the total domination of the Uzumaki's will. Take the boy's staff. The Rakage, Tsuchikage, and Samurai Lord were shocked to see the rumored suicidal agents appear in the disclosed meeting room. However, the three ladies accompanying Naruto acted, using their mixed taijutsu to disable and put down the dozen root agents while also contending with Kakashi and Sasuke who joined the fray, leaving Naruto to calmly walk up towards the horseshoe ring seats. Meitarumi, leader of the Kiri Rebellion. Fifth Mizukage of the village hidden in the mists. Too long have you wandered the shadows that your predecessor had sat in. Naruto spoke with empathy while Mei continued to show an empty stare. Not replying. Back to the others, Amayuri back fisted the last root agent while Tuyuya kicked Kakashi into the stone floor. Effectively knocking him out, Kurama easily beat Sasuke who failed once again to try and control this kitsune that humiliated him leaving him on his stomach as he tried to crawl away. Yet the tall woman turned Sasuke onto his back and put her right foot on his face. I would stay still if I were you. Kurama leered at Sasuke while letting her high heel put pressure on his skull. Hearken to me, Naruto commanded the Mizukage who now seemed to stare sternly at him. The other cage watched in silence with Danzo being engulfed in sand and surrounded by the bodyguards of Suna. Weapons poised and ready around his exposed neck. Naruto then opened his left palm as his magic started undoing the hidden Uchiha's meddling. I release you from the spell. Only for Mei to squirm a little as she started to chuckle. Which turned into an eerie laugh that had a baritone voice mix with hers. Her eyes glowed red as the male voice overpowered Mei's as the possessor spoke. You have no power here, Kyubi brat. Only another Uchiha can overpower the effects of another Sharingan wielder. Sadly, 
You are merely a boy who cannot live up to the legacy of his parents that foolishly died to save a cesspool of a village. The controlling Uchiha laughed after taunting Naruto. The flame-haired Uzumaki frowned as he decided to get serious, foregoing his cloak to reveal his demonic wings and black armored robes as he summoned his demonic flames. Surprising the possessed Mei as she appeared to be paralyzed in her seat. I will draw you, disciple of Madara as poisoned as drawn from a wound. Raising his staff forwards as the Mazukages pushed back into her seat and into the wooden wall behind the five cage. Wriggling in her captive state as Naruto strode forward boldly without removing eye contact. Chojuro wanted to go to his lady's side. Only for Ao to stop him once again and have him wait a little longer. If I go, the Mizukage will die. Toby spoke. The reply being another surge of physical and mental pushing as Naruto continues his assault. You did not kill me. You will not kill her. Mei growled as her captor refused to let go of his puppet. Kiri is mine. And soon, all the elemental nations will be mine. Naruto pressed forward as Mei's head hit the wooden backboards again. Be gone. And face your demon, Uchiha, face to face. The red-eyed Mizukage was weakening under the power struggle as her eyes glared into Naruto's golden pupils. With a roar, the Mizukage leapt from her seat to tackle the last Namikaze Uzumaki. Merely to be stopped mid-air as the humanoid Balrog let out his own bellow and gave the final push as Mei lands back into her seat with her eyes glazed over. No longer having the tint of red in them. Scene change. In the shadows of another area of the Iron Country Fortress, Toba's body is forced off his feet. Having him skid across the stone floors as the remaining Akatsuki members watch in awe. Seeing the most. Powerful. Uchiha lose his connection to his puppet in a violent way after Zetsu had slipped pain. Konan, Itachi, Kisame, Kakuzu, Hidan, and Tobi into the summit. Itachi goes to lift his fellow clan member who swats his hand away as Obito groggily picks himself up. Keeping his mask firmly on while hiding his now useless bleeding eye. Losing one of his precious Sharingan from that supernatural attack. What happened? Pain asked in his monotone body with the other five bodies standing beside them. The Kyubi Jinchuriki. He somehow cut my connection from the Mizukage. His father was able to cut my connection with the Kyubi when he disabled my body. Yet the boy did the impossible and broke the Genjutsu of the Sharingan without being near my physical presence. Toby informs in his Madara voice. Then I shall be the one to deal with the last piece to our weapon while also removing the shadow of the leaf's soul from this world. The rest of you deal with the cage and their shinobi. Let's see how this demon fares against a god. Says Pain as the group moved to surround the leaders of the elemental nations. Scene change Chojuro went to help his Mizukage as she fell off her chair. The other cage were silent by Naruto's ability to overpower the Sharingan. Not even Danzo believed that such a thing was possible as he was imprisoned in the case cage's sand coffin. Mei slowly regained conscious as life filled her eyes and her hair and skin had a more healthy and rejuvenated tone that made her look younger and more appealing. She may have not been in control, but she was able to watch from the sidelines in the back of her mind to know what was going on. She smiled and gave Chojuro a peck on his left cheek, causing the blushing swordsman to faint on cloud nine while Mei embraced her handsome devil much to Karama's and the other's aggravation. Seeing another woman wanting to claim their devil before them. You certainly are something, Uzumaki-kun, Mei Terumi said in a flirting manner. Another time perhaps, Mizukage sama Right now, we must deal with the warmonger before our enemies make their appearance, states Naruto. What are you? You were meant to be my weapon. Yet you no longer appear to be a fox brat with those flames and demonic appendages. Do you even hold the Kyubi inside you? Danzo frothed losing his composure. I am what you and the villagers made me. A demon born from their shadows and hate-filled fire. Yet I am to be this world's protector as my clan was meant to. The Uzumaki never sought great power like the five great nations. Only to use their blessed talents and gifts to hold back the down-spiraling cycle that you all have suffered in your wars and power struggles. Said Naruto. The cycle would have ended itself when only one village was left standing. The Leaf didn't need your clan to share their secrets to the rest of the world. Only Konoha deserved the benefits while everyone else got the useless scraps from the now lifeless ruins. 
Only I can lead Konoha and the rest of the world to a better future. Danzo blurts not caring at the shocked faces of the other cage at being played by that warhawk. Then you shall help bring peace to this world by sacrificing yourself in the greater good, an emotionless voice says. The room is shocked when they found themselves surrounded by the Akatsuki. With the Rinnegan leader Payne having one of his bodies standing in front of Danzo. The Warhawk tries to break free with his Sharingan. But it is too late when Payne shoves his hand through Gara's sand and grasps Danzo's chest. Pulling out his screaming soul as Payne summons the head of the Underworld King to swallow Danzo's soul. Gara has his sand drop the now motionless corpse to capture that one Payne. When another one stretched his hand and dispersed the sand away. The pains gather and now aim their Rinnegan eyes on Naruto. Their eyes seeing his chakra was alit like it was made of fire as the shape of his Balrog form shadows his human body. So, we meet at last Kayubi Jinchuriki, said Pain. Hail, clansmen from the land of rain. We need not be enemies. For the true enemy is among your ranks hiding his face and intentions to all. He will betray you and take your power for himself once you take the Kayubi's chakra. Naruto points to Tobi. Madara's goals are aligned with mine. Bringing peace to the world by unleashing the great power of the Ten Tails until all hatred is dead. Nagato declares. So, you believe only great power can hold evil and the horrors of the world in check? Asks Naruto. Yes. For only power can stop the pains of the past and repeating it again in the future. You and I both know the pain this world has brought on us and on our families and friends. Pain speaks calmly to his clan member while everyone else watches in silence to see how Naruto replies. Indeed. The world has suffered long in the wars between the powers of Shinobi. Even I fell to many that wielded great power. However, the one who ended my pain and suffering opened my eyes to other ways that stopped the pain and allowed my scars to heal and fade in time. In his words, he found that it was small things, everyday good deeds of ordinary folk that kept the darkness at bay. Simple acts of kindness and love. Konoha has forgotten what expressing those feelings felt like. I experienced that love and kindness of the simple folk when I was once a member of Team 7 and helped in completing a bridge for the Land of Wave. It was also there that I learned true strength comes from protecting the people that are precious to you and that may become precious. What utter nonsense. Pain scoffs. Is it? To whom do you fight for peace? The world is too big for one man to carry the burden alone. Even with your gifted eyes, the weight of such a burden cannot be placed on one mortal man, said Naruto. You can if one of you is the child of prophecy. Jiraiya pops up out of his hiding spot to look at his former student and the demon that took Minato away from him. Jiraiya sensei, you haven't changed a bit since we last saw one another, said Nagato. Nagato. Conan. I'm sorry I failed you. But this is not the way. Nor do I agree with the monster that was my godson. But one you must accept the responsibility of putting the world first by not letting pain guide your actions. Jiraiya declares. Hypocrite. I have moved on from my past pain, but you and the remaining citizens of the leaf refuse to let go and rather let your fear and hatred drive you. As it is driving the Akatsuki. Naruto pointed out. Enough of this. Give me the nine tails. Pain directs to Naruto. Only for Kurama to remove her heel from Sasuke who was now staring at his older brother Itachi. Ignoring the part where Kurama reveals her fox ears and nine biju tails as Pain confirms with his Rinnegan that his woman is the Kayubi in human form. She walks to Naruto's side before placing a hand on his shoulder. He smiles to her before having his eyes point her to facing Tobi who shivered at the woman's likeness to Kashina. Naruto then stamps his staff to the floor creating a firewall that separated the cage, Shinobi, and his lovers with the Akatsuki. Leaving Naruto to face all six pains. You shall not pass. Naruto says calmly before the flames envelope him. Transforming into his towering demonic form as he bellows in defiance to the god of rain. Then so be it. Pain says before getting the Balrog rams them through the walls and out into the nippy mountain air. Five of the pains split up to surround the demon as the one pain with the short spiky orange hair charges forward at the devil that stands in the god's path to peace. Back to the others, the cage join together to eradicate the Akatsuki forces. Onoki dealing with the mad priest Hidan and his partner Kakazu. B and his shinobi facing off against Kisame. 
Mei and her protectors fighting the origami Tenshi Konan, and Gara and Naruto's lovers facing off against Tobi and Zetsu, leaving Sasuke to fight Itachi alone. Jiraiya headed out of meeting room to find an alternate route around the Hellfire to watch Nagato and Naruto fight, to determine which of them will be the true child of prophecy. No one noticing that a white snake had slithered his way into the building and was going to where Itachi and Sasuke were battling. Scene change. Pain gritted his teeth as the monster used his infernal flame whips to keep his distance. Even using the universal pull ended up working to the demon's advantage. Naruto wielding the former Mist Demon's sword, that was now called Renudan, in his right hand to swipe two of the pains as they burnt to ashes from the weapon being engulfed in the Balrog's flames. Bellowing at the remaining four as he beat his wings to spray the flying snow everywhere as he vanished in the blizzard. Nagato would not let this demon hide from his senses as he used his summoning pain to summon a large bird, ox, and dog to help him fight. The bird flew above the clouds to try and spot the burning foe. All the eyes of the Rinnegan connected in sight so pain was always aware. When the bird spots the Balrog the ox charges forwards, the two enemies locking horns as the large dog split into four dogs to restrain the demon. The human pain summoning chakra rods as they went to cripple Naruto. But the Balrog had years more experience that Pain could ever hope to achieve. The ram-horned behemoth throwing his sword into the bird as it falls from the sky in a blaze. Using his now free hands to lift the ox from the ground before throwing it at two of the dogs. Summoning his sword to his hand again he cleaves one dog's head before impaling the other. His fire making certain that the dogs did not regenerate or split apart to survive. He then forms a flaming hammer that hits the ground sending a wave of fire at the human pains, melting the ground snow at the same time. Nagato uses another almighty push to hold back the cursed flames, the god roaring in anger and defiance. When the flames dispersed, the Rinnegan power blew away the blizzard in the clouds to reveal an open clear sky, leaving only one pain left as he gasped for breath, debating on whether he should do what the original sage of six paths did, Imprisoning the demon inside another moon while he went to regroup with Toby to claim the Nine Tails. S. He stares into the glowing embers of the Balrog who snorts back. Readying for another charge. Pain accepts his prognosis and summons the gravity ball to begin the formation of the second moon. Planetary devastation. The end. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.